ערב טוב חברים, ברוכים הבאים לקבוצת ג'נסיס. הערב יש לנו את ההרצאה השנייה של לוידי יונג בנוגע לאסלאם. הכל, זאת אומרת, אנחנו נראה את ההוכחות ואת המקורות לכל התייחסות שלו, והפעם לשם שינוי אני חושב שגם יהיה לנו הקלטה בווידאו, אז נדמה לי שאנחנו יכולים להתחיל. לויד, uh, the, the floor is yours, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So hi everyone, my name is Lloyd De Jong. I'm South African and I lived 11 years in the Middle East. I worked some of that time in national defense. I traveled extensively across the Middle East. I lived and worked with Muslims. I um, spent a lot of time in conflict areas designing uh, security systems, the, the, the type that failed or were destroyed that allowed uh, Hamas to, to enter Israel. So I designed systems that monitored borders that um, provided early warning detection, uh, surveillance at long range, wide areas. So I have some familiarity with the issue. And of course I studied Islam because I was curious about the mindset, the ideology, especially with ISIS, Bataclan 2015. And I studied the Sharia. Now, few people really know very well the Sharia. Muslims are not allowed to speak about it. It is too, embarrassing. It is too revealing of what the consensus is of the Islamic sources. Someone in your chat has been speaking about Muslims only follow the Quran. Well, then who interprets the Quran? Who says this is the final meaning of that? And that would be the highest strength scholars in Islam, because Islam claims to be a political system. It also claims to have a full legal system. And that is not found in the Quran. The Quran doesn't even have the names of Muhammad's wives. Where do you find the names of Muhammad's wives, those are absolutely positively not found in the Quran, right? So maybe with the exception of Aisha, uh, how to do the prayers, that's not in the Quran. You're not going to find it. So how can the Quran be authoritative if the Quran is missing significant major parts of Islam? So of course, there's the hadiths. I showed a little bit of that last time. The hadiths are called wahi, mean, meaning they are revelation. So they are considered as important and sometimes more important because they provide an exegesis of the Quran that is missing in the Quran itself. And of course, if you study to be an Imam in Islam, you have to study the Sharia. You go to university and you go to like Al-Azhar. And <clears throat> actually, so I'm on page 731. So let me go here. So there's a few things that I will do tonight. I'll focus mainly on Jihad, on the concept of violence in Islam and show you its basis. Right. And then later on, we'll allow chance for questions. So this is, again, the reliance of the traveler. The reliance of the traveler is the most common, the most popular, the most used of the Islamic Sharia law manuals. Right. And so here we've got the certification of Al-Asar, you'll see. And it, this, is, this is the subject. These are the subjects that are discussed within this. The validity of following qualified scholarship. Muslims are obligated by law, by Allah's word, to follow Islamic scholars. This thing discusses marriage. Now, for instance, where are the marriage laws in the Quran? If your friend who was waxing lyrical about, well, you know, Muslims only follow the Quran. Well, okay, so you want to have a wedding. Please show me in the Quran which page we're going to find how to conduct a wedding, all the wedding laws. I'd love to see it. And you and I both know it doesn't exist there. You're not going to find it. Someone had to go through all of the Islamic sources, including the Kitab al-Sitta, the six books of Hadith, and there are multiple, multiple volumes of these things besides just those six. Notice here from page 506 to page 554, you have marriage to divorce. So you have 48 pages here dedicated to just marriage, rules of marriage. Those rules are not in the Quran. So either the Muslim scholars, the highest ranked scholars on earth to have ever lived in Islam, either they're lying which is going to be a bold claim for our, the woman to make, or maybe there's things she doesn't know about Islam and she really needs to sit down and be quiet. Divorce, you can see from page 554 to 578, justice, enormities, and this commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. This is the primary doctrine of Islam. This is fundamental to Islam. So this is, within Christian doctrine, you've got the Great Commission, which is to go forth and convert the world in the name of, you know, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit, and so on. In Islam, Muslims have to follow this ruling here, commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. If they don't, God will turn his back on all Muslims and they will all go to hell. 
at least some Muslims. Okay, so there's a table of contents. So let's quickly go to the Al-Ashar. All right. So let me... The documents. Okay, so these are documents of warranty. With the warrant of Sheikh Abd al-Waqil Durubi. Okay, so these are... He's the Imam of the Mosque of Darwish Pasha, Damascus, Syria. Okay, interesting. Sufi mosque. Interesting if Sufis are not Muslims. Interesting that this is the very first of the Islamic law manuals, the Muslim law, the Sharia manuals, to be translated into English. It had the highest priority because it was the most common, and this is one of the most famous and most authoritative of these Islamic law manuals. Here they're speaking of the translator. He understands the texts. Let me just get my mouse pointer up. He understands the texts of this volume and is qualified to expound it and translate it to his native English. So in other words, he has read through the classical laws of Islam, Imam of the Mosque of Darwish Pasha. Great. That's his seal. Here we've got another one, the Mufti of the Jordanian Armed Forces, who tells us, I found the above mentioned brother knowledgeable in what it contains and qualified to expound it and translate it into English and observe his accuracy and integrity in quoting the text. Excellent stuff. Then we also go to this guy. This is the International Institute of Islamic Thought. This is a Muslim Brotherhood Front organization, a textbook for teaching Islamic jurisprudence to English speakers and a legal reference for use by scholars. This translation is superior to anything produced by Orientalists in the way of translations of major Islamic works. It has a sound understanding of Islamic law. And it's this guy, president of the International Institute of Islamic Thought, Islamic Fiqh Academy at Jeddah, and president of the Fiqh Council, the legal council of North America. So I'm guessing that these people have more authority than whoever that woman was in the chat earlier today. Al-Azhar is where Barack Obama went, of course, when he wanted to... I'm just providing the bona fides of this document to see why it is authoritative. And Al-Azhar is the most prominent, the most famous, and the oldest and most prestigious Islamic law seminary and university in the world, in Egypt. And this is where Barack Obama went to go and bow to the Muslim Brotherhood. So certification of Al-Azhar. Okay, and it says here, we certify that the above-mentioned translation corresponds to the Arabic original and conforms to the practice and faith of the Orthodox Sunni community, the al sunnah wa al-Jama'ah. There is no objection to printing and circulating it. Fantastic. So let's go back to where we were earlier. Okay. I think the number was 731. Ah. So this is the primary commanding the right and forbidding the wrong. The obligation to command the right, it's a communal obligation. All Muslims have to do it and the levels of obligation. So let's have a look. This is Islam's holy law, the Muslim holy law, right? And they speak here of, first of all, a Muslim must explain that something is wrong. So he has to have knowledge of the Sharia to explain to non-Muslims what they're doing wrong, what defies Islamic law. Remember, Sharia law applies to you. Are you alive? Excellent. Sharia law applies to you. Are you a Muslim? Doesn't matter. So first, forbid the act verbally. Then censure with harsh words. In other words, use vile language. Call their mother a whore. Swear at them, right? Writing the wrong by hand. Now, writing the wrong by hand. What? Uh, who knows what that could mean? Who? Any? Anyone have an idea what writing the wrong by hand could mean? Who knows? It's a mystery. Then, intimidation, assault, and force of arms. Now, let me see. Do you guys have, within the Jewish holy scriptures, right, within the Jewish law, do you have these steps which, inquire, which require Muslims to uh, do this kind of thing? Wolfman, do you have force of arms, assault and intimidation as part of the uh, Jewish I, doctrine? I'm not aware of such. Well, Definitely not today. Part, this is part of the, the perfect law of Allah to be followed by all Muslims. Assault and force of arms. Let's have a little look at that. Okay. Commanding the right and forbidding the wrong is the most important fundamental of the Islamic religion and is the mission that Allah sent the prophets to fulfill. That includes David, Moses, Abraham, you know, all those Muslim prophets. If it were folded up and put away, religion itself would vanish. Islam would vanish if they didn't do this. So let there be a group of you call to good and command the right and forbid the wrong for those are the successful. So there's that small minority of Muslims who must always do this. Okay. They must always do this. So, so basically, let me see. Whoever of you sees something wrong, let him change it with his hand. If unable to, let him change it with his tongue. 
if he cannot change it with his heart, okay, with his tongue, change it with your heart. And that is the weakest degree of faith. So in other words, use your hands to do something. Do something physical. Right? We'll have a quick look through this. So it says here that if you don't do this, Allah will put the worst of you in charge of the best of you, and the best will supplicate to Allah and be left unanswered. Allah will turn his back on the Muslims. All right? So let's continue. Now, it says here, some scholars have said, okay, that the person delivering the censure, and this includes violence, as we saw, it escalates to violence, must have permission to do so from the caliph. This is untrue. For the Quranic verses and hadiths all indicate that whoever sees something wrong and does nothing has sinned. So stipulating that there must be permission from the caliph is mere arbitrary opinion. So yeah, that's a common lie that Muslims will tell. Okay, so let me see. Uh, let me go to something. Um, so this will be commanding the right, forbidding the wrong, will be obligatory until the day of judgment. So now, what may be censured, I want to mention here. Um, okay, it is so if something wrong is manifest to another outside of a Muslim's house, such as the sound of music, oh my gosh, someone who hears them may enter and break the instruments. This is Islamic law. Music is illegal. So therefore, if someone is playing music and you can hear it in their house, you have the right to enter that person's house that is trespassing and you may smash their music instruments. If you smell the odor of wine, the sound of opinion is it is permissible to enter it, the house and condemn it. All right. Fantastic. Okay. One should not eavesdrop at another's house to hear the sounds of musical instruments. Okay. But if you do hear it, and if two upright witnesses come and inform you, one may enter his house and take him to task. And we'll have to see what kind of things this says, okay? But let's go to the portion with the violence. So we already know that you can do things. So let's talk about intimidation. The sixth degree is threatening and intimidation. Stop this or I will. And when possible, this should precede actually hitting the person. So let me see. Threaten them and then hit them. These are the laws of Allah. Threaten people, then hit them if they do things that violate the Sharia. And the rule for this level is not to make a threat that you cannot carry out. Then proceed to assault. The seventh degree is that to directly hit or kick the person or similar measures that do not involve weapons. This is permissible for private individuals. Oh, thank, thanks. Praise be to Allah. Allah works in mysterious ways. The eighth degree is when one is unable to censure the act by oneself and requires the armed assistance of others. Yeah, there is no need for the caliph's permission. My, oh, my. So, yeah, any thoughts so far on this, Wolfman? I, I, the religion of peace, my friend. That's what I get from The religion me. of a lot of yellow, warm peace. Def definitely, definitely, definitely peace. Okay, so let's let's move to something else. All right, I will come back to all of that. This is ISIS, right? This is the Rumia issue nine. If you have this on Google Drive, Google will delete it and send you an email threatening you, the ruling on the belligerent Christians. So if you're not a Christian, you're a Jew. It doesn't really matter all that much. Let's have a look at a few of these rulings and see if we're going to see this. So kill the mushrikeen wherever you find them. Are you not a Muslim? Well, you're one of these people. The default with regards to the blood of Mushrikeen is that it is permissible to shed. Fantastic. Due to the statement of Allah and when the sacred months have passed. Quran 9.5 and 9.32 play a big role here. Then kill the Mushrikeen wherever you find them and capture them and besiege them and sit and wait for them at every place of ambush. As the Prophet said, say, I was, I was commanded to fight the people until they say, blah, 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 blah. And the Mushrikeen cannot render their blood inviolate inviolable except through a dimma contract or a covenant of security and safety. Now, everyone said everyone said ISIS were extremists. ISIS were not following Islam. Well, ISIS were following Islam extremely accurately. All right. So what we need to do is, let me go to... Um, so now I want to go to a different section. We want to talk about jihad. Okay, so let me just run up to that section.
21. Let's go up a little further, 19. Okay, jihad. So here we've got, okay, I'll actually go, I'll start with apostasy, just so you can see this again as further corroboration. Okay, apostasy from Islam. If Muslims love to deny that apostasy involves the death penalty. It does involve the death penalty. It is murder. Anyone can kill you. We've already discussed some of that in the previous episode. We discussed what happens if people don't believe in Islam. Whoever voluntarily leaves Islam is killed. That's what it says in this Islamic law manual. There's no indemnity for killing him. In other words, there's no punishment on you for killing someone who has left Islam. And then they speak of jihad and the scriptural basis for jihad from the Quran, which we'll see that ISIS just said something similar. We'll see that. And the obligatory character of jihad. Okay, so 08. Point zero. So let me see. And the objectives of jihad and regarding Jews and Christians. Why am I? Uh, so you might not like, be interested in jihad. Yes? Uh, one second. Uh, before you go to jihad, uh, what makes one a Muslim? If the mother is a Muslim, then you are a Muslim. If the father is a Muslim, oh, then yeah. you are a Muslim. Uh, the, Judaism, the, the, the line is matrilineal, whereas in Islam, it's patrilineal, um, technically. But also, to say a Muslim, you... okay. So a Muslim will do something bad, and a Muslim will say, that's not a real Muslim, it wasn't a Muslim. No. To, to be Muslim, I think there are three criteria. One, you believe you have said the shahada, okay? La ilaha, la ilaha, blah, 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 right? You've said the shahada, you believe in Allah and Muhammad as his prophet, and you believe in the last day. The last day is when Muhammad comes back. That day will happen, the return of Muhammad which is the, the end times, will occur when the Muslims murder all the Jews in the world. So once the Muslims kill all Jews, then the end times will come. So that those are the three things that make you a Muslim. So no matter what a Muslim does, there is no crime that a Muslim commits that will not make him a Muslim as long as he believes in Allah, believes in Muhammad, right? Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, believes in the last day, and has said the Shahada. Does that answer that? Thank you, yeah. Okay, so now I want to go to 08.1. Oh, by the way, the following are not subject to retaliation because you know that, that, that honor killing is a common thing in Islam. The following are not subject to retaliation. In other words, you cannot have, there's no kind of legal punishment, a Muslim for killing a non-Muslim. There is no punishment for that. Or killing an apostate from Islam, okay, killing an apostate from Islam is without consequences. Interesting. Killing an apostate from Islam has no consequences. And at all, there is no, there is no penalty, no legal penalty, no punishment for a father or mother or their fathers or mothers for killing their offspring or offspring's offspring. A father, a mother or grandparents can kill their children or their grandchildren if they believe that this is honorable in Islam. There is no punishment. Do you understand the brutality and the depravity that is Islam? So I'm going to go to section 08. Okay, let me skip ahead here. Let's see where we are. Oh, the indemnity for death or injury of a woman is one half the indemnity paid for a man. The indemnity paid for a Jew or Christian is one third of the indemnity paid for a Muslim. The indemnity paid for a Jew or Christian, so you are worth one third that of a Muslim. Now, of course, Muslims and others love to say that. Now, I come from South Africa, which was an apartheid state. And to be honest, at this point in my life, I miss apartheid because the black government is a disaster. The black government is an incompetent, corrupt cabal. And yeah, things were actually better under apartheid. But that said, people love to call Israel an apartheid state. No, this is Islam. In, is, in Israel, everyone has the right to vote. Everyone has equal authority and equal rights under the law. In Islam, if they get their caliphate, you are going to have very, very little by way of laws. And indemnity, the indemnity paid for Zoroastrian is one fifteenth that of a Muslim. So there you know your value. Okay, so there you know your value. That's fantastic. Let's continue here. Let's go to this section here. And uh, here they talk about what is kufr. But that's not that critical. Okay, so this section is in black. This is not relevant. The reason I've taken this section out is because this is not in the original Arabic text. The author added this section. So this the author added. They do this within the Sharia because they want to try and soften the message. There are sections that were entirely removed from this manual. You can find them in others. 
So for instance, this is the legal, the Shari definition of jihad. This is not some fool's private definition. This is the legal, and you'll see it's consistent across all the Sharia law manuals. If you go to my channel, I've got detailed, lengthy videos going through multiple Sharia manuals showing the consistency of the consensus, the ijma across all of the schools of fiqh. Jihad means to war against non-Muslims. Notice it doesn't say to have more salads, walk little old ladies across the street. It says jihad means to war against non-Muslims and is etymologically derived from the word mujahada, signifying warfare to establish the religion of Islam. That is the legal definition. There is no other legal definition. Now, there are 14 or 13 or 14, depending which source you check, variants of jihad. There are many, many kinds of jihad, but this is the only legal definition within Islamic law. The others are variations. For those on, with azima ruksa on that spectrum of of relaxation and strictness, this is the final definition. This is the only legal definition. The scriptural basis for jihad prior to scholarly consensus, which is the ijma defined in B7, is such. Quranic verses as fighting is prescribed for you, Quran 2, 216. Slay them wherever you find them, Quran 4, 89, and fight the idolaters utterly, Quran 9, 36. I have been commanded to fight the people until they testify that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. If they say it, they have saved their blood and their possessions from me. ISIS was just writing that in Rumiya, so maybe ISIS are not so extreme. Maybe ISIS are just doing this accurately. The obligatory character of jihad. Jihad is a communal obligation. There are two kinds of obligation in Islam. Fad al-Kifaya, right? And uh, Fad al-Ain. Fad al-Ain is an individual obligation. So in other words, every Muslim is required to pray. Right? That's Fad al-Ain. However, there's also the Fad al-Kifaya, which is a communal obligation. So in other words, that obligation of prayer, daily prayer, that communal obligation falls upon the highest level of scholars. And those scholars, their prayer means much, much more. Their prayers, their prayers are worth thousands of times that of the individual. So those prayers are what actually saves the ummah. Right, so the individual has to pray, but but the major prayer. So, jihad is a communal obligation. A small minority of Muslims must always be practicing jihad, at least twice a year, once a year at minimum. If they don't, Allah will start to condemn the Muslims. Now it says here, because apparently the Prophet said, "He who provides the equipment for a soldier in jihad has himself performed jihad." That's money, weapons, assistance, intelligence. And those of the unbelievers who are unhurt but sit behind are not equal to those who fight in Allah's path with property and lives. Now, what is interesting is that you'll find that the Sharia routinely quotes the Hadiths. Now, this woman who was speaking earlier, she was going on only the Quran. Well, a Quran-only Muslim is known as an apostate from Islam. So the Sharia constantly quotes the Hadiths, right? So you'll see that all the time. Now, if none of those concerned perform jihad, and jihad does not happen at all, then everyone who is aware that it is obligatory is guilty of sin, right? And jihad was a communal obligation. And there are two possible states in respect to, mon to non-Muslims. The first is that when they are in their own countries, in which case jihad is a communal obligation. And this is what the author, the translator, whatever he's speaking of when he says, jihad is a communal obligation, meaning upon the Muslims each year. In other words, they've got to go into your country, right? So the second state is when non-Muslims invade a Muslim country or near to one, in which case jihad is personally obligatory. Every Muslim, now jihad becomes fad al-ayn upon the inhabitants of that country who must repel the non-Muslims with whatever they can. Jihad is personally obligatory for everyone able to perform it, male or female. Fascinating. Okay. Who is obliged to fight? Those called upon to perform jihad when it is a communal obligation or every able-bodied man who has reached puberty and is sane. Jihadis are not insane. They have to qualify as sane. Interesting, right? <clears throat> it is offensive to conduct a military <laughs> expedition against hostile non-Muslims without the caliph's permission. Okay, so don't do it unless there's a caliph. And Muslims will say, but there's no caliph, so therefore you can't. But it goes on to say, though, if there is no caliph, no permission is required, so could do it anyway. This is really common in the Sharia. If you read through it enough, 
you're going to find that um, they contradict themselves in the sentence right after constantly. It's, it's a pretty common thing. So, yeah, so don't do jihad if there's no caliph. But if there's no caliph, do it anyway. Don't worry about the caliph. And the objectives of jihad. The caliph makes war upon Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians. And you don't forget, if there's no caliph, just do it anyway. Provided he has first invited them to enter Islam. And we'll see that, sure. They'll say this and then say, well, you know what? But if you don't wait for permission, if you don't invite them and just attack them and kill them anyway, that's okay. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Just go on with your life, right? The war continues until they become Muslim or else pay the non-Muslim poll tax, the jizya, in accordance with the word of Allah, who said, fight those who do not believe in Allah until they pay the poll tax out of hand and are humbled. He means humiliated you. Well, we can go into different sources that translate this, shall we say, more accurately. Nothing but Islam will be accepted. Yes? I don't understand. If they are paying the jizya, the tax, then they, you don't necessarily have to kill them? Um, Jizya is designed to humiliate and to cripple them economically. It's designed to humiliate. It's designed to force them because you will not be able to repair your places of worship. You cannot hold public services. You cannot worship freely. In theory, they say, yes, you can, but it is really designed to also, for instance, your children, you cannot allow, if your children are not Muslims, they cannot inherit your property. So what happens is your places of worship crumble into dust your properties eventually come to Muslims and it's, it's just, and there's no minimum for the jizya. There's no minimum requirement for what I have a very detailed, I have a couple of very detailed videos on that on my channel where I go through the laws. I go through in detail from multiple sources from the Muslims. And so what you about see Jesus. The, well, yeah, yeah. They, uh, some said to me, uh, they are not going to touch the people of the book and the people of the book are That's Jews and Christians. Okay. Now, if you go through, again, if you go through the details on my channel, you're going to see that that you are heavily discriminated against. I mean, it, it's just cruel punishment. I'll, I'll go through some of that. So Jesus is a Muslim. Jesus will rule with the Sharia. Okay. And the Caliph fights all peoples until they become Muslim. Okay. So, so that should give you an idea of what exactly jihad is. Okay. Now, notice when a child or a woman is taken captive, they become slaves by the fact of capture. Okay? And the woman's previous marriage is immediately annulled. So this is Islam. When an adult male is taken captive, the caliph considers the interests of Islam and the Muslims, and he decides between the prisoner's death, slavery, release without paying anything, or ransoming him in exchange for money or a Muslim captive. If the prisoner becomes a Muslim, then he may not be killed and one of the other three alternatives is chosen. It is permissible in jihad to cut down the enemy's trees and destroy their dwellings. Muslims love to say you can't cut down the trees. The Sharia says otherwise. And in truces, in sacred law, truce means a peace treaty with those hostile to Islam involving a cessation of fighting for a specific period. Are you not a Muslim? Then you are hostile to Islam. That's, it's that simple. So truces are permissible, not obligatory. It is a matter of the gravest consequence to have a truce because it entails the non-performance of jihad. So in other words, Muslims should think hard about forming a peace because this means they are not doing jihad and they're required to do jihad or Allah will turn his back on all the Muslims and they will go to hell. So any thoughts so far on what I've presented here? I'm just trying to figure out uh, what are the consequences of the things you're teaching us here in regards to our current situation. Um, that, that means they have to go to war as part of their jihad, as part of their must. responsibility as Muslims. It's obligatory. Yes. Yeah. You see, there must be an interest served in making a truce other than preservation of the status quo. You see, truce must give them some kind of strategic advantage. It's that simple. Because it says in the Quran, do not be faint-hearted and call for peace when you are the uppermost. If you have strength, if you have the strength, then make war. So they That's will simple. do it just to reorganize, Yes, basically. Yeah, if the Muslims are weak, a truce may be made for 10 years if necessary. It is not permissible to stipulate longer than that. 
except by means of new truces, each of which does not exceed 10 years. But of course, they can break that truce at any time. Okay, that's called hiyal. They can break an agreement, an oath, a truce at any time. No legal agreement, nothing in Islam is sacrosanct. I have a, to- I have a talk on hiyal, H-I-Y-A-L. You have to look at that. It's Islamic deceit, Islamic deception, legal trickery, as they call it. You have to understand there's no promise, no oath, no truce, no agreement can be trusted. So, okay, so any thoughts on what I've presented? That is jihad from this, and I can go to some other sources as well. Any comments no, or I just, questions? I, I, I just understand that we are dealing with a perpetual war. Um, there's no yes. way around. You either sub- destroy them or you will be destroyed. That's what I get from what you teach. Um, Correct. Would you like me to Correct. see if there are questions right now? Yeah, please. Yeah, let's have a look if there's any comments or questions on that. חברים, יש לכם שאלות? אם כן, תרימו בבקשה את היד ואני אפתח לכם את המיקרופון. TK wants to ask you a question. Are you willing? He's going to ask me, like, what's the orbital velocity of the moon? Let's try. Is it okay to lie about... Yeah, go on. TK. Hi. So what would you... What would you say... is the um, uh, trying to think of the words here. I'll just put it like this. In Yemen, for hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years, the Jews lived there under Muslim rule. I guess for about a thousand years, they lived under Muslim rule. Um, I'm not going to yeah. say with no problems, but under the, uh, the uh, umbrella of the jizya until they decided they didn't want to pay it, and then they were exiled and basically killed. But... Uh, until they, you know, as long as they were paying the jizya, it was okay. So, the, I guess Do you my know question what the is, laws of the jizya are? Are you familiar with them? Do you know where to find them? N- no, I'm just asking you from the perspective of, uh, you know, of history. We know that the Jews did have, they did live there in relative peace, and they did have their communities, and they weren't... So, <laughs> look, the fact is these laws are on the books. It doesn't mean that every Muslim leader is going to is going to implement them fully, right? There might be some who, for whatever reason, they decide they don't want to do this, and they don't. Or they do them half-heartedly, or they do them to a limited degree. This is also legal and allowed in Islam. This, this between strictness and relaxation, this azma and ruhsa, that this is perfectly normal. But that said, they could. It, the next guy could have a son, or another leader comes along and says, you know what, we're going to crank it up. We're going to, we're going to follow the book to the letter, and then things change, right? And also, in many cases, they needed the education that was present in a lot of the Jews for administrative purposes. They couldn't do it because the Jews often were, were doing administration within these civilizations. They could read, they could write, they were educated. And, but also, once they didn't need them, they would expel them because they didn't need them anymore. They've taken all their possessions. Now they're just a burden. They didn't want to convert necessarily all of them to Islam. They needed people to, to be the menial, you know, to, to provide money, the goose that lays the golden egg and so on. Um, so yeah, things, but the, the thing is that ISIS instituted this fully. Hamas is a theocracy. Iran's a theocracy. They, they live under these laws. They apply these laws and they want to one day implement these fully, strictly, in which case things are going to be very, very bad. So it might be going nice today. That doesn't mean it's going to go nice tomorrow. The Muslims will murder every single Jew on the face of the planet for the love of Allah, because this is going to bring Muhammad back. And who wouldn't want that now? One I more question, question, please, Ronnie. Yes. yes. Um, if uh, the Islam says that the Christian is uh, infidels, so how the those uh, this matter of marriage between a Muslim and Christian exist? There are a lot Muslim of, uh, man can many... marry a Christian woman, but not the other way around. That that's that's specified in the marriage laws. If you read the marriage laws. I've got talks on that on my channel as well. If you go through the Reliance of the Traveler that we saw earlier, um, if I go here, hold on. Um, here, if you go to the section on marriage, this will talk about, that's on page five or six here. This will talk about how a Muslim man can marry a Christian woman or a Jewish woman, but not the other way around. That's not allowed. So you are infidels, but you are people of the book. The thing is, look, Islam doesn't make sense. It contradicts itself. When you read the laws, they contradict themselves, but it, it's not rational. It doesn't make sense. So it, it, 
they don't seem to care very much because they're not thinking straight. Uh, sorry, do you have more? I mean, more to that question? Ronnie, you have something else you want to ask? Currently, I'm thinking about something. No, please continue, Lloyd. Okay, great. Um, hopefully that answered the, the question. Hopefully that... Um... So, okay, now for instance, Muslims like to lie and say there's no such thing as amputation and those are just extremists. So this is, now remember, this is the Hedaya. Okay, on page 10 here. <clears throat> this is the Hedaya. This, the Hedaya, the commentary on Islamic laws, right? So someone will write a fiqh manual, a sharia manual, right? And usually these are very thin. They're very small. And those manuals just contain some basic outlines, uh, basic exegesis from the Quran. Then a commentary will be created. The Hedaya is four volumes and it's mm, three volumes or whatever. It's, it's 2,652 pages or something like that, if I recall. So in other words, the Quran is like a small, tiny book. It was exegeted by one of the Mujtahid's mutlaq, like Shafi, into a book that's maybe 100, 150 pages that, that says, okay, this is the meaning of these, all of these verses, let's exegete those, and this, this, this is the meanings that we have, right? And then someone takes that 150-page book, 100-page book, and he turns it into a commentary, which is a full legal commentary with application to all, you know, it, it, like the Talmud, it goes and applies this law to every situation and provides general and specific rulings. Then you get thousands of pages. And we saw last week, I discussed the Pakistani courts that use the Hedaya. Okay, so the Pakistani courts, for instance, I showed the example paper by two PhD scholars in Pakistan. This is the Hedaya. This is what they still use in Pakistani courts today because this is considered probably the most important. This is the Hanafi manual, but this doesn't mean that it's not applied or used by other schools. Don't let people lie to you and tell you, yeah, but that's a Shafi book. You know, the Hanafis don't. Bullshit. Okay, bullshit. These books are used across because this contains the ijma, right? And depending how strict they want to go, they'll decide which one. But the Hanafi is the largest school of fiqh or Muslim law, right? It's the largest of these madhabs, as they call them as well, schools of persuasion. So this one is prime. That's why the Pakistani courts still use this today for counsel on how to apply Islamic rulings. Okay, so let me go back to where I was. So amputation, as you can see, thefts which occasion amputation of the manner of cutting off the limb of a thief. So you can see here from page 107 to page 126. So there's 19 pages that explain how to cut off the hand of a thief in case you were interested in knowing how. Now, it's weird that there's like one or two verses in the Quran that talk about cutting off the hands of a thief. But here there's 19 pages. So maybe this is more important in a way because it explains exactly when, why, how. Who, right? So if you can find all of this information in the Quran, well, great. Good luck to you because it's not there, but it's right here, right? And the manner of waging war, plunder, and the division thereof. Now, pirates do plunder, but apparently this is a holy act for Allah, plunder. And the division of plunder and so on and so on. Let's have a look. The conquests of infidels. My, oh, my, if Islam's a religion of peace, what do they mean he had the conquests of infidels? And of Jizya, the capitation tax and the laws concerning apostates. So fascinating stuff. So let me just go up here again. Uh, I'm going to go to on the manner of waging war. So I need to go find that. Larceny, highway robbery. Okay, so now, al siir. Siir is a word meaning war. Okay, um, they now have the sira, right, which is supposedly the prophet's biographies, the gospels of Muhammad. But the original root of the word sira is sir, which is sir in the language of the law, more especially applies to the institutes of the prophet in his wars. So the Sira are really a discussion of the wars of Muhammad. Muhammad is the perfect example, the perfect man. And if Muhammad did it, no Muslim can say anything against it. It is the perfect act, and therefore they must repeat exactly what Muhammad did. Did Muhammad kill people and rape little girls? Go for it. It's good to go. The manner of waging war, plunder and the conquests of infidels, as you can see there. 
Right, let's have a look through the Hadiah, the most voluminous, possibly, and certainly, arguably, the most important, the most relevant of the Islamic law manuals, the largest and most detailed. Now, if you become an imam, you go to university, you study to be an imam, a sheikh, a qadi, you will study basic manuals, like you'll start off with the Muqtasal Quduri, for instance, which is a basic introductory Surya manual, and you'll end after five years, seven years, whatever, you will study the Hadiah, because it is the most detailed. Now, let's see what it says here. War must be carried on against the infidels at all times by some party of the Muslims. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Right? Let's see what it says here. I'm just trying to zoom in a little bit more. The sacred injunction, the sacred ruling or law, command, instruction, Concerning war is sufficiently observed when it is carried on by any one party of the tribe of Muslims, and it is then no longer of any force with respect to the rest. That small minority of jihadis, you see. So the rest don't have to do it as long as that small minority are following jihad as fad al kifaya, right? Jihad as a communal obligation, right? It was laid by Allah in the Quran. Slay the infidels. It's a divine ordinance. Allah said it. Allah be praised. He works in mysterious ways. Slay the infidels. Are you not a Muslim? Then you're an infidel. And also by a saying of the Prophet, war is permanently established until the day of judgment, meaning the ordinances or the law respecting war, the commands from Allah. It is enjoined for the purpose of advancing Islam, the true faith. And they speak here of jihad fad or ordained war. Okay, war to be waged against infidels, known as the holy war. Okay, that's pretty unambiguous. Let's continue. Okay, when this end is answered by any single tribe or party of the Muslims making war, the obligation is no longer binding upon the rest. If, however, no Muslim were to make war, the whole of the Muslims would incur the criminality of neglecting it. So it is a criminal act for Muslims not to wage war on infidels, not to wage war on you, then all of Islam goes to hell. Understand, it is a crime in Islam not to murder people. So, yeah, this violates the Islamic law. Do you want to, the word for this, this is messed up. Do you understand the depravity, the violence? The destruction of the sword is incurred by infidels, although they not be the first aggressors, as appears from various passages in the sacred writings, which are received to this effect. And it says here on the right-hand side, infidels may be attacked without provocation. Infidels may be attacked without provocation. Why were these books translated into English? Well, because these were the most critical of the Islamic law resources, especially in countries where the British and others were managing, dealing with Muslim issues. They needed to, in terms of their courts, they needed to get these things into English so they could manage according to the Sharia. So these books were prioritized by the governments. Get these books in English because these are the ones the Muslims actually use. And they speak here of katal, meaning war in its operation, such as fighting, slaying. So yeah, killing, killing people dead. From, from which book are you quoting now? The Hedaya. Hedaya. Uh, 157. Let me go back up. This is the Hedaya, the show you here. This is when I spoke of the, when I showed the PhD paper about the, 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 the major of the four Islamic law manuals that are still used today in Pakistani courts. This was the first one on the list. The head daya. Here. And what about the other Muslim countries? What kind of... Uh... No, this is, you see, this is, this is, look, there are four schools of fiqh. There are four schools of fiqh in Islam, in Sunni Islam. This is the major manual. This is the crown jewel in the Hanafi school. Right, the the reliance that we saw is the Shafi school. However, it's not like it's not like these are four separate religions. It's like, for instance, you might have the King James version works for 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 the Church of England, and then the Catholics have the Dewey Reams, and then of course you've got um, maybe the the Lutherans like the NIV. It's just slightly different variations of the Bible. It's not like they're four different religions; they just have variations. They all say the same thing. The one might say, Christ is the lamb. And you go, what, he's a lamb? And the one says, Christ is the redeemer. That's like two different gods. What do you mean? It's like, no, it's just different. You know, it's just, it means the same stuff. It's just slightly different phrasings and so on. 
what for instance, about the Shia? You're, you're talking here about Sunni countries. It's about 80% the same. It's not like the Shia or Buddhists. Have you ever mistaken a Shia for a Buddhist? <laughs> no, I didn't. What's the chances? Do they look like Muslims or do they not look like Muslims? Do they talk about jihad and killing or don't they? So the same not writings the apply there? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty much the same. It's pretty much the same across the board. If anything, the Shia are probably more strict and it's probably worse. So, on the manner of waging war. Now, this is not when because, oh, we went to war against them. And think about it. In the 690s, the Muslims had invaded France. The 690s, if not earlier, right? The Muslims had invaded France. They were already in Spain. They invaded Spain. They were invaded France. They were kicked out of France in 732. Kicked out of France, forced out of France in the 700s. Now, please let me know if the French had invaded Saudi Arabia at any time in the 500s, the 600s, the 700s, that they deserve this. And now it's like, well, you know, the Westerners attacked Saudi Arabia in the 1950s and, and they deserve to bullshit. Utter bullshit. The Muslims have been invading Europe. Actually, hold on. You know, that, that true. That is something. Um, um, I remember that uh, you showed evidence for. Um, uh, Muslims uh, reaching out even to Iceland and Denmark and so many yes. other places. And that basically exactly. I told my friends that um, the Crusaders is basically a defense war, which is 400 years late to the imperialistic uh, uh, wars engaged by the Umayyad and the Abbasid empires. Um, was I correct? Can you verify it? Yeah, let me, let me just actually do this. So while we talk about this, okay, this is just a brief summary. This is not the full document. Um, hopefully I have the document. Hopefully I have the information here. Okay, so let, let's have a quick look at this, right? The first crusade began during the Middle Ages in the year 1095 as a cry for help against invading Islamic armies, right? It started... 460 years after the first Christian city was overrun by Muslim armies, right? So 1095. So let's go calculator, right? Let's take 1095. Let's minus 460. So the Muslim armies, within three years of Muhammad's death, they'd taken Saudi Arabia, right? And much of the mid of the of the of Arabia. So, so. In 635, they'd already invaded the first Christian city. The Crusades were 457 years after Jerusalem was conquered by the Muslims in 637. This is 453 years after Egypt was taken from Christendom by Muslim armies. 443 years after Muslim armies invaded and plundered Italy. Did you know that they invaded Italy, right, in the 600s? 427 years after Muslim armies laid siege to Constantinople. 380 years after Spain was conquered, 363 years after France was first invaded by Muslims, minus 363 years from that date. And understand, in the 690s, they were already in Spain, trying to take over Spain. 249 years after Rome was attacked by Muslim armies, twice. Okay, this was after four centuries of church burnings, killings, enslavement, and forced conversions. By the time the Crusades began, 75% of the Christian world had been conquered and its people forced to convert or be enslaved under Islam. So these wars, right? The Charles Mortel kicked the Muslims out of France in 732. At no point in time can you say here that the French had invaded Arabia and deserved it. That would be an utter lie. Okay? Let's have a, let's have a look at the timeline of jihad. 630, Muhammad conquers Mecca with 30,000 men. 632. Now, they have gone into Sweden, Iceland, Poland. What the heck are they doing in Ireland, Iceland, right? They conquered Cyprus, Tripoli, North Africa, Iran, Afghanistan, India, 673 to 678, Constantinople, right? Dome of the Rock is completed in Jerusalem, right? The lower Indus Valley in India in 713, they conquered that, all right? So you go through these dates. Muslim crusaders capture Palermo, Italy, Right, 831. The Muslim Crusaders conquer Sicily, Corsica, Italy, France, so can raid in 901. Do you understand how much warfare these Muslims have brought? And this is just, right, do you understand what's, what's been going on here? This is insanity. 
right? I remember um, that in one of your talks, you mentioned that there are like two books which are summarizing the complete uh, wars through history of 8,000 years of records that we know of. And you said that yeah. 99% of the wars were uh, wars by, you know, governments, kingdoms and stuff like that. And 7% was religious war. And, yeah, and so all four percent four percent was by Muslim and all the other religions combined was less than three. Yes, something like that. Yeah. So 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 okay. Eight eight historians, eighty eight historians who specialize in warfare wrote something called um called the Encyclopedias of Encyclopedia of Wars. And it starts eight thousand BC and works its way to the present day. So it's ten thousand years of human warfare. Now, now, some of the wars, for instance, like you have like the Peloponnesian War, I think, which lasted for 250 years, right, and consists of hundreds of battles. They made this one war. So in other words, they could have made this into a dozen, 20, 30, 40, 50 wars, which would have increased the number of wars and would have increased the number of, uh, well, changed the statistics, right, to make it even worse. But that said, so they made some wars that lasted for a long time. Even if they had dozens and hundreds of battles, they made them one war, right? And 93% approximately of those wars were wars, government, secular wars, right? Governments. However, only about 6.8 or 7.2% of all wars in history are religious, have what they called a religious component, right? Only about 7% of all wars statistically known have a religious component of which more than half are purely Islam, more than half. All the other religions combined, every other religion combined makes up like 3% and Islam on its, <clears throat> on its own makes up like 4%. So yeah, let's have a look at, um, this is the Jihad timeline. So this is why the Vatican has this wall because the Vatican wall is like this because of Muslim invasions, right? So let's have a look here. For instance, this is not a complete list, but Albania was invaded by the Muslims, late 14th century. Armenia, 640. Austria, Vienna, 1529, 1683. Belarus was invaded. Bosnia, Herzegovina. Bulgaria, 1396 to 1878. Crete, 650s to 960s. Battle of Tours, France. France was invaded in the 690s already. Hungary, Iceland. And they took people. They always took women for their harems, their slaves. They always took men and women and boys and girls, right? Baltimore, Ireland. 1631, Israel, 637, 750, 970 to 983, 1024 to 1077. Italy was invaded, Lithuania, Macedonia, Malta, Poland. Poland was invaded in 1669, 1671, 1672 to 1676. Portugal, Romania, Russia, Sardinia, Serbia, Sicily, Spain, Ukraine. Did the Ukraine ever invade the Middle East? Like, no. So what are the Muslims doing there? Do you understand? This is what you're dealing with. This is this is the insanity, the Muslim insanity that you are dealing with. So, any comments or questions before I go on? I have a question. Um, what's the reason, or the basic reason, that, for example, the government uh, in Egypt is against the Brotherhood, and also in other countries in the Middle East? So this doesn't mean that the Egyptian government doesn't follow Islam and doesn't want to kill you, certainly, but the Muslim Brotherhood is the world's largest terrorist organization. It's a secret society. It's the world's largest secret society. It has a couple of million members probably and, and, and 100 million adherents, followers. They are heavily funded. They've been involved in wet work since their inception in 1928. It was founded by a Sufi and a Freemason, Hassan Albana. Albana is not his real name. Albana apparently is a play on the word builder. Or Mason, builder, Hassan Albana, Arabic for builder. So he predicted that they would bring the West down by in, in 100 years. That's their plan. In 2028, they would destroy the West. They would destroy America. They would destroy Israel. They would bring down Western civilization. And so they've got five years to go, four years and something to go to meet that goal. And they so their plan was to infiltrate, to use their money to infiltrate into the West and to put themselves in positions of government, power, military authority, media and so on, but they want they want this final confrontation, they want this final war. So the Egyptian government, they have been a threat to the Egyptian government. They've assassinated, they've assassinated various Egyptian leaders. They um, for instance, when I was in the Middle East, 
uh, in Dubai, they expelled like a hundred people, Egyptians, because they were Muslim Brotherhood. So the Muslim Brotherhood are a political threat. They are a terrorist threat. They are a serious problem. They have a lot of money, a lot of followers, and um, they they are willing to kill to get their uh, to get their political aims done. They they are heavily influent, influential in Jordan, for instance. So yeah, they they are pushing hard. But um, I would like to add on his question, uh, if the governments are relatively secular and they are uh, in opposition to the Muslim Brotherhood, for example, in Islam, you have Sisi, in Jordan, you have the kingdom. Why is it that when they already have complete independence, why is it they, they, that they don't apply the Sharia in those countries? Why Sisi is don't. against them? Yeah. It depends. I mean, look, individual Muslims might do things for their own reasons, right? It doesn't mean that the Sharia doesn't exist. Islam has a constitution. It's the Sharia. So the fact that they're not applying it doesn't mean that they won't do it tomorrow. They have in the past. ISIS did it. The uh, Taliban are doing it. Hamas wants to do it, right? Um, also, they might be they might they might be not so secular, but the the ones upcoming in the next election might be very very religious, right? I mean, they might be secular, but the next ones might be very theocratic. So, and also some of them are on a bit of a slow burn. Like some are saying, okay, you know what? Uh, we'll simply just, we'll simply use infiltration. We'll use money in the UN. We'll use money in the universities and we'll just convert everybody. We'll do it slowly. And others are like, yeah, let's do it with the, with the gun right now. Let's do it at the barrel of a gun and boom, let's just kill everyone and take over the world. So some are on the quick path and some are on the slow path. It doesn't mean they're not on the path. I understand. All right. So let's see what the Sharia tells us on the manner of waging, waging war. And we'll see if it's, if it's in response to warfare or if they have to proactively go and kill you. Right. When the Muslims enter the enemy's country and besiege the cities or strongholds of the infidels, it is necessary to invite them to embrace the faith. Right. <clears throat> if, therefore, they embrace the faith, it is unnecessary to war with them because that which was the design of the war is then obtained without war. In other words, the design of the Muslim war is to make you a Muslim. The whole point of jihad is to convert you to Islam, the whole world to Islam, and then the end times will come and Momo will come back. The Prophet has said, we are directed to make war upon men until such time as they shall confess. There is no Allah, but Allah. But when they repeat this creed, their persons and their, their lives and properties are in protection. ISIS wrote the very same. ISIS was using standard, normal Sharia. And they must then be called upon to pay jizya, a capitation tax. And by submitting to this tax, the war is forbidden and terminated. And if I go into, this is a, that's a separate subject on its own, if I go at length into the Sharia and the jizya and the dummy status, that, that, that's pretty disgusting. It's pretty nasty. Okay, now... <clears throat> Okay, the people will perceive that they are attacked for the sake of religion and not for the sake of taking their property. Interesting. And on this consideration, it is possible that they may be induced to agree to the call to become Muslims in order to save themselves from the troubles of war. I think they're pretty honest here. If a Muslim attacks into infidels without, without calling them to the faith, without saying, Embrace Islam, or we're going to kill you. It's okay if you embrace Islam, then we won't kill you. But then it says in the next paragraph, but if you don't do that and you just kill them anyway, right, because this is forbidden, but yet if you do attack them before inviting them and you kill them and you take their property, there is no fine, you don't have to expiate your sins, and there's no atonement because that which protects them, namely Islam, does not exist in them. You see how Sharia will say one thing. So a Muslim can throw you this little sop and say, but look here what it says. And then he misses the very next sentence, which literally contradicts the previous sentence, which nullifies. In Islamic law, every single law is nullified by a counter law. Every single law. And there's a principle called hiyal, which allows them to circumvent, neutralize, or do the opposite of every single law in Islam. There is literally not one thing in Islam that is sacrosanct. Not one. Everything has a legal loophole. Everything. So That's in very the same Gnostic. manner, as we, yeah, exactly. It's Gnostic. It's yeah. It's 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 satanic. 
And in the same manner as the slaying of the women or infant children of infidels is forbidden. <gasps> Thank God, killing women and children is forbidden. But if a person were to slay women and children, you are not liable to a fine. Imam, I murdered women and children. I murdered five babies and seven women. It's like, okay, look, we're not going to give you a fine, okay? If we did fine you, it's probably like like five bucks, ten bucks or whatever, but but look, you know, in this case, we'll waive the fine. So, so just, just try not to kill any more men, women, and children anymore, okay? But there's no fine. So does that, did you feel relief learning that, Wolfman? Yeah, I'm relieved. Yeah, I mean, where's Eleanor? Maybe she wants to tell us a little bit about her views on Islam. I mean, maybe she's an expert. Maybe she'd like Actually, to... Actually, I will invite her. And, and I want to make a comment in Hebrew because I want to invite anyone who wants to challenge what you say. Because sometimes I have all those clowns that are coming later when you're not here anymore and we don't have the sources and we don't have your um, mastery. And, and then they have a lot to say. And, you know, doubts or basically saying that you are very one-sided and all the rest of it. So I would like to address my friends in Hebrew and to tell them that if they want to challenge mm -hmm. it and if they have evidence for them to provide it now, would you allow me? Yeah, sure. Yeah. אז חברים, uh, הקטע הזה שאתם, חלק מהאנשים מופיעים בשלב יותר מאוחר ואז הם פשוט באים ואומרים, הוא, הוא מאוד מגמתי, זה מצג שווא או כל דבר אחר שיש לכם לומר, uh, אז כרגע יש לכם הזדמנות יוצאת דופן להוציא את הסורסים שלכם, את המקורות שלכם, את ההבנות שלכם ולאתגר אותו והוא יתמודד עם כל מה שיש לכם לומר. אז אם יש מישהו שיכול להדגים, לא ברמה של שאלה, אוקיי? לא ברמה של פשוט איזשהו ויכוח מיותר, לבוא ולהדגים שמשהו שהוא אמר שקרי, או מגמתי, אנו עמכם, תרימו את היד, אני אפתח את המיקרופון ואתם תציגו את מה שיש לכם לומר בעניין. האם יש מישהו שרוצה לאתגר את הדברים שלא ידמר עד עתה? And because Allah is the destroyer of his enemies, the infidels. So you are the enemy of Islam because you are not a Muslim. And you must attack the infidels with all manner of warlike engines. This is all sanctified by the law, which takes me to a brief detour. Which takes me to a brief detour. And here is where I need to speak about Iran. So let's have a look here. Let's have a look at the... The peace-loving Republic of Iran. This is in the Islamic pub Republic of Iran's constitution because Islam is religion of peace. And as you know, peace is yellow and warm. All right? And doesn't smell so good when it's been left in the sun for a little while. Right? That's why they say it's religion of peace. So, in the constitution of Iran, it states, this is in the preamble, a religious army. In the formation and equipping of the country's defense forces, due attention must be paid to faith and ideology as the basic criteria. Accordingly, the Army of the Islamic Republic of Iran and the Islamic Revolutionary Guards are to be organized in conformity with this goal. And they will be responsible not only for guarding and preserving the frontiers of the country of Iran, but also for fulfilling the ideological mission of jihad in the way of Allah. We've just seen what jihad is in the way of Allah. It's to spread Islam by the sword, by force throughout the world. That is, extending the sovereignty of Allah's law throughout the world in accordance with the Quranic verse. Prepare against them whatever force you are able to muster, strings of horses, striking fear into the enemy of Allah and your enemy and others besides them. Quran 8 verse 60. You see... The Iranian revolution is to be exported around the world. The, the revolution will not be contained in our borders. The revolution will go after everybody. Iran sponsors terror around the world because this is in Iran's constitution. If you actually take the time to read the constitution, it says lower down in the constitution that they will ally themselves with all sorts of revolutionary movements around the world to promote Islam and destroy the West. That's, so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm missing the religion of the peace, but I'm seeing the piss. That's for sure. So, your thoughts on that? Uh, I, I have to go through that, but I, I can see, uh, you know, the idea behind it. Um, can, can, if, if you're done or yeah. before you're done, yeah. maybe you can say a few things about the perfect man that every Muslim has to follow. Maybe we yeah, can have... Yeah, certainly. I actually have something on that up, yeah. I will. So, 
Notice it says here, war is an observance of a divine law, and atonement is not due for anything which may happen in the fulfillment of a divine ordinance. But they beheaded children, they beheaded babies, they murdered women, they raped women. Well, war is following the will of Allah. Atonement is not due. You've done nothing wrong. Understand, you've done nothing wrong because there's nothing wrong which may happen in the fulfillment of Allah's law, right? For otherwise, men would neglect the fulfillment of the ordinance from an apprehension of becoming liable to atonement, and therefore you are free from any sin and you are free from any punishment. You may do as you please in this war. You understand why Muslims will tell you but they did nothing wrong. Hamas did nothing wrong. They could fuck little kitties, okay? They could jam spears up someone, up a kitties, and parade them on poles. And you know what? That's okay, because that's war. Because they're fulfilling Allah's will. Allah works in mysterious ways. This is how depraved and sick this is. Do you understand? It's a divine ordinance. That is to say, it is enjoined and authorized in sacred writings. Look, I'll take the Muslims at their words, right? Maybe they're just telling us what they believe. Who knows? So let's have a look here. It is not laudable to carry young women along with the army. Don't take too many prostitutes with you for the purpose of carnal gratification. If, however, the necessity be very urgent, female slaves may be taken. Yeah, but not your wives. You can you can shag prostitutes. Don't shag your wives because Islam is all about morality. Good stuff. Good stuff. You understand, there is literally not a single law in Islam that doesn't have its inverse, its opposite, that cannot be broken. Nothing. Check my series on Hiyal. I go through this in detail, in excruciating detail. Um, yeah, so I'll wind down here. But I think I've made my point. I think I've made my point here. Uh, any thoughts or comments from the audience or yourself? You didn't want to go to Muhammad for a, for a second? I will. Yeah, no, on this, on Jihad, I think I've said enough. I think I've kind of made my point in terms of Jihad. Yeah. Right. I have, so I have a question, uh, the million sure, dollar please. question. Yeah. I have the million dollar question. What, mm -hmm. is, for your opinion, the, we will have any solution from, for this problem? Look, I have been asked by people about this in the past. I worked with a group in the past. One, you have to be you have to make this information public. People have to realize the Sharia. The Sharia is Islam's weak underbelly. It is, a, it is a sin. It is, in fact, treason. It is a crime for Muslims to reveal the Sharia. What I'm doing here is a crime. This is, this is a, a death penalty crime for Muslims to reveal. It's a death penalty penalty for, for me to reveal this, okay? Because the Sharia explains Islam accurately with no bullshit. This is pure, unadulterated accurate, clear Islam with no confusion, right? So this has to be made public. I mean, people have to start showing this, putting memes out, putting out screenshots, social media, so that everyone can see that all of the Sharia books say the same things. There is no confusion in the Sharia books. Muslims may lie, but these are written by the greatest scholars in Islam to ever live. It's like their Moses, their Abraham, their Jesus all wrote this stuff, and they can't be wrong. Moses can't be wrong. Abraham can't be wrong. Jesus can't be wrong. God can't be wrong. This is Allah's law, the perfect law. This is the law of Muhammad. Understand? It needs to go out there. People have to learn and see just how depraved, disgusting, satanic, and evil Islam is. And then talk about it. Um, and, and yeah, also, the other solution, besides shooting everyone in the head, um, which is probably not that practical, you have to convert them. Quite bluntly, now... Quite bluntly, you have to train the, – the solution that I thought is going to be the most practical is to train Christian apologists to know the Sharia, to understand the enemy, to understand the doctrine. This is Islam's war doctrine. Understand, if you've been in the military and all of you have been as, as, as Israelis, you've been in the, in the army, this is the enemy's doctrine of warfare. This is their, this is their fighting doctrine, right? This is their threat doctrine. Understand, the Sharia is the ultimate foundation of their threat doctrine. The, the simplest solution after me thinking about this for many years and, and wondering about this, train missionaries in this so that they know it and send them out to convert Muslims to Christianity, right? Just convert them like crazy. Make them Buddhists if you want. doesn't matter. Just anything but Islam, okay? Convert them to you pick the – whatever. I mean, but seriously, I would say make them Christians. 
Muslims who become Christians are often very, very devout. They become on fire. So personally, I'm not a huge fan of um, Protestant um, Gnosticism. So I'm not, I'm I'm not going to recommend going down that route, but that said, I mean, any other differences aside, but at least I think, I, I personally think that the Lutherans are not invading Israel and killing your women and children right now. So, so man, if you have to go that route, fine. This, but convert them, train, train missionaries because you have to defend your culture. You have to defend your religious roots. These people believe in this stuff. And so you need to find people who are serious and just convert every Muslim you see. Start proselytizing like crazy. Does that answer your question? But conversion is not very likely. I mean, we are not going to be able to go to Gaza or Iran or Lebanon and start speaking to people and suggesting them Christianity, which we know almost nothing about. So any other? Yeah, no, I don't mean you guys, but you need to encourage Christian churches to do this. You need to encourage religious groups, evangelical groups to do this everywhere, everywhere, because the funding is coming from the West. The funding is coming. So you need to send, you need to, you need, you need, missionaries everywhere that's the only way to to get them away from these sick ideas so it's either conversion or that we have to the understand truth. that we are dealing with rel- a relentless war yeah endless war for all time great we are lucky to be islam must be destroyed islam has to be destroyed it must be humiliated and exposed publicly the sharia exposes islam does that answer your question? Um, I think it was Roni, right? I'm not sure who asked that question. Yes, yes, yes. I, uh, I understood. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Matania, do, uh, do, Matania do, do you have any questions you wanted the last time? No. And yeah, just one minute. If you can... Show us a little bit about, um, how do you call it? Uh, I'll do Muhammad. I'll do the Muslim yeah. Brotherhood a little bit, and then I'll do Muhammad as well. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let's go. And uh, when my friend will be ready with the question. Ah, well, there, yeah. are que- there are questions here. One second. Okay. Okay. Tal, Tal Nadav, go ahead. Tal, open your microphone. Sorry, I would like to know more about the Prophet Muhammad and what is the Sharia? Did it come after Muhammad or before Muhammad? The Sharia is the... Okay, so Muhammad brought... Okay, the Sharia is... Think of it as a way, right? Okay, Islam, I didn't show those slides, didn't go to that, but for now, I have a detailed talk and I've got shorter and longer talks, five-minute videos, ten-minute videos, two-hour videos, depending. Islam is a political system. It is like Nazism. It is like socialism, right? Think Stalin, think Lenin. It is, it claims to be a full political system and it claims, Eleanor, are you listening? Sharia claims to be a full legal system. So you have to ask yourself, if Islam is a legal system, where are its laws and what are its laws? I have just showed you some of the legal texts where we find the laws of Islam and I've shown you what the laws of Islam say. This is the final exegesis. Now, Muhammad came and he supposedly dictated and he left the Quran, right? And then Muslims had to take this tiny little book, which says, I don't know, um, eat chocolate on Tuesdays, right? Eat chocolate on Tuesdays. And then it said, and then they like, okay, uh, what kind of chocolate? How much chocolate? Uh, Can we drink the chocolate? Does it have to be dark chocolate? What about milk chocolate? Can we add strawberries in the chocolate? What about nuts? You understand? This is now it gets like the Talmud. So the the Muslim scholars had to look at the Sharia and had to look at the Quran and go. It says chocolate on Tuesdays. Allah wants us to have chocolate on Tuesdays. What if it's going to make us fat? Do we have low fat chocolate, low carb chocolate? Do we use sweeteners? What do we do here, right? And then they then they go through the other sources, like they go through the Hadiths, they go through the Sira, right? And they look through these sources. They go through the Tafsir, the commentaries on the on the on the Quran, and then you've got. Over a thousand years, you've got 10,000 scholars, all of them squabbling, all of them, and eventually four major scholars, five in total, ultimately, but four major scholars come along and they're like, you know what? We've got to sort this crap out. We've got to come up to a consensus called the Ijma. And they write, the, they, they, so the law starts to form. It took 900 years for the Sharia to ultimately form, but it's all based on the Quran, exegesis, and eventually Islamic practice and Islamic law is defined. 
So they build this and eventually they have like this, by the 10th century, they've got this Islamic law more or less worked out, right? Can you please send me the PDF I was using the lecture? Yes, I can, AA. I will, I will give them all to, um, to my host and then I will provide the links. If you can pin them later and then I'll just provide all the links to all the books, all right? So I'll make everything available to everyone. Please one, remind one me. One more question. One more no, no, question. I'm not done yet. Uh, give me a second. I'll explain. So, so Muhammad left the Quran. Then scholars came along later, and they eventually sorted throughout all the con all the noise and confusion, and they said this is the final interpretation. The Sharia is the final understanding and the final interpretation of what is in the Quran. It is the, in fact, it even supersedes the Quran. It is the final, final understanding with no confusion. That is the Sharia. It's what all Muslims have to follow. It's the law of Allah. Hopefully that gives you an answer. Sorry? Yeah. Also, one more question. Aren't you supposed to be protected close for the... Sorry, sorry, you're breaking up. Say again. Aren't you supposed to be a protected class in Islam? Aren't Jews a protected class? Okay, so, so yeah. here's... A, okay, let, let me explain this protection. Okay, I didn't do a talk on Demis and Jizya, but let me explain how Jews are protected. Jews and Christians, how you are a protected class. You're in Italy, you're in Sicily, and a couple of guys with these little thick jackets and little bumps under the jacket come in, right? And they go, hey, what, you know, they go, hey, uh, hey, Jimmy, you know, nice shop you got here. It would be a shame if all your windows got broken, your daughter got raped, your dog got shot, your kid had his throat stepped on, and, and all the shit in your stall got broken, and you ended up with five broken fingers and a broken jaw in hospital. It would be a real shame, wouldn't it, Jimmy? You know, but you know, if you pay us a little bit of money, we can we can ensure that that doesn't happen. What do you say? We come around on the on the first of next month, and you give us a thousand dollars, two thousand dollars. No, you know what? Make it. You look like a rich. Make it five thousand dollars. We'll see you on the first. You give us a little bit of money, and we'll make sure you're protected. Do you understand? That is yeah. the protection. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tal. There's one more question. question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. So, uh, <laughs> so basically, my uh, original question was, uh, what do you think is uh, the, the the part of Muslim in all of the, you know, uh, Illuminati? And then you explain that they are uh, saying that they are the Illuminati, and then you, sh you show the, the connection to the Shriners, to the... Can, they claim to have founded the Freemasons, the Muslim Sufis, the Sufis yeah. claim. Don't forget, yeah. the Sufis run Al-Azhar University, the most, the world's most famous is Muslim so university is run, by a, is run by a Sufi, and they claim to have founded yeah. the Freemasons. Yeah. So it's, this is the origin, or maybe there is like two, you know, heads of the snake. That's one of them is Islam, and they are. What do you think? I, I'm a bit confused. Islam. So, look. Ultimately, when you trace these groups, like the Shriners, they claim to inherit the original Egyptian mystery religion. So do the Freemasons. At the end of the day, and that claim was first made in the ninth century by the Sufis in Spain, after they found supposedly in Haran they found certain Babylonian rites which claimed to have inherited the Egyptian mystery religion texts. And the Sufis claim to have taken this with them to Spain when they conquered Spain and settled in Cordoba. So it would seem that the claim goes back the earliest. As I said, even the Rosicrucians, Christian Rosenkreuz, this whoever he was, um, clearly a nickname, uh, he claimed to have learned Rosicrucianism in Morocco, which last I checked is not Buddhist or Catholic, right? I'm reasonably certain it's Muslim. So even Rosicrucianism comes straight out of Islam. Right, the Nazi Party was founded. So remember, Rudolf von Sabotendorf, this this guy becomes a Sufi, becomes a Freemason and a, and a and a and a Rosicrucian, learns it from the Sufis, right? Learns it from Muslims, becomes a high-ranking Muslim Imam, goes to Germany, founds the Tool Society, and the Tool Society gets joined by all the Nazis just conveniently, right? And one year later, boom, the Tool Society changes his name. We're now the Nazi Party. We're a Muslim occult society. Eleanor, are you listening? So. Um, so, yeah, they, it would seem, and also they claim that Hermes Trismegistus, now if you look at Madame Blavatsky and all of these occult groups, they all trace their roots to Hermes Trismegistus. Even the Gnostics are an offshoot, seems to be split off from the secret knowledge of Hermes Trismegistus, Hermes the, thri the thrice great Hermes. This, 
And if you read the history of Homies, trust me, you read the, it's complete bullshit. But um, it's laughably stupid, but they all claim to trace back. And the Muslims claim that Hermes was a Muslim, effectively. He is the ancestor of Muhammad, and they have incorporated his teachings. He's, he's part of Islam. He's Idris. He, the, this major occult figure that underlies all of these secret societies, Hermes, just Magistus, is supposedly Idris in Islam. He's the second prophet mentioned in the Quran, and he was a Muslim. He was a prophet of Allah. And so, yeah, that, that's the craziness. I would, like, I would like, like, yeah. just a second, Ali. So, um, Hermes and Hermit, uh, the Hermitism, it's different than yeah. Gnostica, than Gnosticism? They, they're similar in some ways, they're different in some ways, but they, 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 have, they seem to share a common root, but they, they have similarities and their differences. But the thing is, even Gnostics don't agree with themselves. I mean, look at Protestants, they can't agree with themselves either. They're just all over the place. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, YouTube, so yeah. that's just how it is. But they, they all converge on a certain point. And you have to have a root source somewhere. There's always a root source. And he seems to be the root source where Gnosticism splits off and goes their own way. But they keep some ideas. So they merge in some ways and they separate in some ways. But even the Gnostics do the very same. Did, did you research about uh, Hermes? Uh, talk yeah and, but uh, I, haven't, I haven't done any videos yet but I have a lot of notes that I need to start editing and um, do shows on yeah I would love for you to share them with me if you're willing yeah, I just want to say to me before... is bullshit. it's so funny it's stupid honestly when you read the actual history and the claims you realize it's fiction it's 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 comedy gold but but people take it seriously um, I just want to say to my friend uh, when you listen to Mark Passio for example he would usually Uh, use the hermetic seven principles and it will push it to your brain while selling you ideas of freedom. So just be aware. Uh, one second, more questions. Doron? Hey, Lloyd. How are you? How are you? Um, I want to say well, thank you. Um, a question. Uh, it's a basic question, but the Sharia, what is the, the, like the, the meaning of the word itself? Where, what is the origin of the Okay, wait, wait, wait. Good, okay, fine. Now that you've asked. Um, okay, so... Okay, so let me try and be precise, because I... Um, odd. Okay, so my software is, of course, going to give me a hard time, so let me use plan B. Give me a moment because I can I want to try and get you um... I just have okay. to say this is unbelievable the, the amount of the knowledge uh, that you gather it's unbelievable thank wow. you appreciate that um, yeah hold on my software is not working as it should I hate when it does this Uh, the software is not crazy reliable. This index has thousands of documents for me and allows me to search through them. But, um, okay. No, okay, it's finally, it's done. It's rebuilt the index. Okay. Uh, so now I need to go forward because I want to give you an academic answer on this one so that you have clarity. Um, Come on. And I thought it was a simple one. It is simple. I, I just that I'd like to show people that I'm utilizing. Why is it doing this to me? I hate when the software decides to, yeah, it's, you pay for this stuff and it's not always reliable. Let me just jump forward because. Thank heavens. Okay. Now it should work. Let's, let's hope it does that. And it works like I pay for it to do. No, of course not. Okay, I'll do this manually. Okay, so I want to show you the definition of the word. This is the, okay, what, I'm, what you're seeing here is volume 13 of the Encyclopedia of Islam. Now, to buy a copy of this book will cost you a copy of this encyclopedia, which is the gold standard academic reference work on Islam written by hundreds of, it's over a century old. It's updated monthly with every three months. It is written by hundreds of scholars over the last 100 years, and it includes Muslim and, and the, the absolute best scholarship, okay? Not that there isn't some nonsense in it, but this, is, this costs you $40,000 to buy if you want a copy. Or you can rent it per annum for $5,000. It's not cheap. So let me see. 
Um, but I want to show that, that I'm not just talking out of my head. Okay, I'm just making it up. Sharia. Here we go. Okay, you see here? So this is volume 13, which is like a, this is like an index to the other 12 volumes. Okay. So Sharia technically means a prophetic religion in its totality. Within Muslim discourse, the rules and regulations, notice the laws governing the lives of Muslims, in other words, a political system. And two, it is Islamic jurisprudence, Islamic law. Just like you have the Talmud, this is far more developed. It's far more explicit. The Talmud is often not very explicit or clear. The Talmud is like got this response to this pilpul, this little debate. The Sharia is often explicit law, just bang, 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 here are the laws, right? In the Quran, where it appears once only, and in the tradition literature, the Hadiths, Sharia designates a way or path divinely appointed. So it is divine law, the law of Muhammad and the law of Allah. Now, within the Sharia, Muhammad speaks with the authority of Allah. In fact, they are synonymous, which is shirk, which is a, which is a crime in Islam, the, the, the ultimate sin of blasphemy, right? So, which Allah does not forgive. But Muhammad, and, and it says, it states so that Muhammad and Allah are synonymous. So it is the religion of Islam, but the, the political legal religion of islam does that answer your question um yes but is there is there a um like a, a meaning to the word itself you know like uh if we way break the or word... road it means so many people will say a path to water it's a way now for instance they'll say it's a way a road technically it's a road to somewhere but metaphorically it's a way like like the the, the dao you know the chinese the dao the way you know, this is the way to enlightenment. It's a way. It's a it's a it's a spiritual way. But, but Islam but you said, doesn't. You said water. What do you mean by by water? So many will say it's the path to water. You'll hear that sometimes, right? But it doesn't. But if you read the see the area around the waterhole, or the point of entry to the waterhole. Now, notice this is a minor definition. It's defined in Volume Eight, Page Two Forty Nine B, in the second column on the right hand side. So this, this is a minor definition because Muslims will almost never give you the primary definition. They'll give you the, like sometimes a word will have 13 definitions and they'll give you number 12. They don't want you looking at one and two. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. And I, I can, I can, I can comprehend the, the, the connection to uh, for everything from this, just from the, from the word, I can understand the, the, um, the concept of the book. Yeah. So, because it's a, so it's a is, water hole. <laughs> the entry point where animals drink. Yeah. So Islam, we must, you must understand, Islam claims to be an occultic religion as well. It's Gnostic. It claims explicitly to be Gnostic. Any Muslim that tells you otherwise is ignorant or lying to you. Probably both, right? So, so yeah, but hopefully this answers your question. You can see that this book, as I said, this 40 grand encyclopedia is phenomenal. It has so much. This is only the volume 13. This is like a short index. And then if you want more, you'll then go to volume eight, you'll go to volume nine, you'll go to, you see, you go here to volume nine, this page. So that's, that tells you where to find data. Any other questions before I do the last section, guys? Yeah, I think Purple Cat wants to ask a question. Purple Cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Cool. So apologies in advance. If you already covered this before, I've joined a bit late today. Um, mm -hmm. But so far, it was very, very interesting. Um, I'm just, um, I, I live in London, so I'm based in London, and I'm exposed to, I guess, Muslims from different countries around the world in my day job. Yep. And I've noticed that there's a big difference between Muslims that are coming from countries like, let's say, Bangladesh or the Maldives or Indonesia, you know, Kyrgyzstan, those kind of countries, than Muslims that are coming from the Middle East. So I was wondering whether, um, or, or what, what derives this difference in the behavior and the ability to integrate into society? It seems that like there are two major kind of uh, streams in Islam. There's the, the, I guess, the one that we know in Israel, which is the one that kind of surrounds us from the Middle East. And there's the one which is a bit more, more peaceful, I guess, which comes from other regions of, in the world, which may be influenced by other, I guess, religions, there's, but... I just want to, to, to get your view on this. If, if just your, your African, Middle Eastern Muslims tend to be more honest about following the Sharia. They tend to be a little closer to the actual strict rulings. The Westerners are more Westernized, but that doesn't mean that tomorrow they will suddenly go from Rukhsa, which is relaxed, 
or not following the doctrine strictly to Azima, mm. you don't know that. And um, many of them are, are, remember Muslims own reward, jihad, one form of jihad is to hate you while pretending to your face to be kind and nice and be your friend. They earn reward for that, this kind of deception. We discussed lying in the previous episode. I discussed obligatory lying in Islam, and this is a form of jihad. So they're only nice until they are told your side's under attack and you now need to defend Islam for the good of Allah. So that that's the problem. Um, so yeah, the Western Muslims, t- some may well be, but the problem is that second and third generation Muslims look at Sweden. Second and third generation Muslims have turned Sweden from the safest country in the world to the most violent country in Europe with gang warfare, shootings, and bombings on a daily basis. That's, you know. I yeah, like I, I, yeah. I'm sorry, okay. I still it. No, no, sorry. No. I thought you were done. No, it just that I think, I think the, the, the source of the Muslims in Sweden is, is Middle Eastern. So this explains why we see the transformation in this country specifically. But again, the, 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 the Muslims that are coming from other countries, even when they're coming to the West, even when they are living in communities of Muslims, seems to be very, very relaxed and chilled in comparison to the Middle Eastern Yeah, because they, they, they're not, okay, so they're not as aggressive as third worlders, because I know the third world mine, I'm from the third world. But I can tell you they are funding jihad through other means. They are infiltrating politics, they're infiltrating schools, they're infiltrating universities, they're funding, they're sending money, zakat, one-eighth of all zakat has to go towards jihad. Mm-hmm. Muslims will find what, there's 13 or 14 kinds of jihad. They're doing one of them. It's obligatory. So they might seem to be very nice, but they're not your friend. And ultimately, one way or another, they're going to be supporting the cause. They're just, they're just on the slow curve. They're just on the slow burn. They're not the ones who are going to pick up the gun and force you at gunpoint to convert. These are the ones who say, well, you know, we'll just send money. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll simply just subvert the, the government slowly and surely over time. Because that's what that's what Islam does. It just does it slowly over time. Yeah. A lot of places they didn't invade. They just, over time, just just escalated over time. And also because they don't have the upper hand in those countries and they Correct. still want to milk the the welfare state and, uh, you know, put, put foot on the, on the soil there, they have to do it gradually. Uh, but I yeah. think, Lloyd, I'm not sure if it's you or Bill Warner that I saw. Um, maybe you have statistics or polls that can sh- demonstrate to us what is happening in so-called secular Muslim countries in, in, in regards to questions about, I don't know, terrorism or whatever. How many I'm of looking, them support and if, you look at, and if you look at the statistics, like 80% of Muslims, like you go to London, you go to the US, right? 80% of Muslims want the Sharia. I've just read to you the Sharia. I've shown you the Sharia. 80% of Westernized Muslims want the Sharia. But ask them, what's in the Sharia? They'll say, oh, the Sharia is beautiful. It's Allah's law and it means that fairness and equality. Bullshit. They know what's in the Sharia. Why do you think Muslims never show the Sharia? Because it is disgusting. It's filthy. Pedophilic trash. So I wouldn't trust them at all. You, you cannot. Okay. Um, okay, let's move okay, on. So, yeah, let's move on, yeah. Okay, so notice the Muslim Brotherhood is committed to violent jihad, okay? And Allah is our objective. The Prophet is our leader. The Quran is our law. Jihad is our way. Dying in the way of Allah is our highest hope. That's the creed of the Muslim Brotherhood, right? This, I've already shown how jihad is legally defined in the Sharia. Now, after the loss, as we mentioned, in the Six-Day War, they came up with a new strategy based on Chairman Mao's um, propaganda tactics. So their methodology is predicated on the sophisticated method, on the sophisticated method of guerrilla and propaganda warfare created by Mao called the People's War. So they leverage an existing strategy that allows them to recruit willing, largely socialist dupes in a common anti-Western, anti-Christian goal. Notice how Islam and socialism always go hand in hand, right? The red and the greens always going hand in hand. Now, People's War involves moral propaganda with a theme of victimization and oppression blended with heroic, uplifting sentiments of victory and moral righteousness. Those Israelis, they're killing us. We're in an open-air prison, and we're victims, and we're oppressed, and we just murdered a bunch of kids and innocent people, and this is moral victory, and do you understand how this works? And with calculated acts, tactical acts of savage violence to sap enemy morale, to make the infidel feel subdued as per Quran 929, and boost that of the resistance. Can you see the terminology and the methodology here? It should be very clear what Hamas and other groups have been doing. 
right? This Sorry, is based send, on Chainlink. Send, send this to the group for a second, please. Copy paste um, it if you don't mind. Yeah, just remind me to hold on. So, okay, when I finish here, I'll try and finish in twenty minutes or so. But I will, I will send. So I'll make a list of all these documents and send them to you. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, <clears throat> right, um, Muhammad Badi, okay, this was one of the leaders here, declared in 2010, today the Muslims crucially need to understand that the improvement and change that the nation of Islam, the Ummah, seeks can only be attained through jihad and sacrifice and by raising a jihadi generation that pursues death just as the enemies pursue life. You understand? It is a death cult and they're not giving up anytime soon, right? Osama bin Laden was a disciple of Al-Qaradawi, and Muhammad Osama bin Laden was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. They forgot to tell you that, probably, right? So, dear brothers, we must not forget to nurse our children and grandchildren on hatred towards those Zionists and Jews and all those who support them. They must be nursed on hatred. The hatred must continue. I wrote this document, by the way. That's why my name's on it. I wrote this for an organization. <clears throat> so, the Muslim Brotherhood, Okay. The Sword of Peace here, this, the, the Swords of Peace, of course. Ikwan Supreme Guide, Muhammad Badi, friend of Osama bin Laden, okay? So, of course, for some reason, the U.S. refuses to designate the Muslim Brotherhood as a terror organization. So, Civilization Jihad. In 1991, the FBI captured this explanatory memorandum. So, the role of the Muslim Brotherhood in America, and don't forget, this is not just exclusive to America, right? The process of settlement, and this is to answer the last speaker, right? The last question. The process of settlement is a civilization jihad process with all the word means. The Iqwan must understand that their work in America is a kind of, and Britain and France and, and, and everywhere, okay, is a kind of grand jihad in eliminating and destroying the Western civilization from within and sabotaging its miserable house by their hands and the hands of the believers so that it is eliminated and Allah's religion is made victorious. So they're doing slow settlement jihad. Remember, wherever a Muslim settles, that land becomes waqf, becomes an endowment from Allah, and they, that land is now Muslim. So if a Muslim settles somewhere, that is Muslim land. He cannot give it up. It's now owned for Allah, and he must fight for it and take it back. Without this level of understanding, we are not up to this challenge and have not prepared ourselves for jihad yet. It is a Muslim's destiny to perform jihad and work wherever he is and, and whatever he lands until, until the final hour comes. And there is no escape from that, that destiny. Okay? So, phase one. <clears throat> Let's work through the five-phase plan for infiltration of an American coup. This, is, this document went to court. These were presented in the largest terror funding trial in the U.S. Okay? And the, the contents of the documents were never contested. They are authentic. Phase one. Discreet and secret establishment of elite leadership. This phase has already been implemented in America. And they are certainly trying it in the UK, France. You pick the country. They're doing it there too. Phase two, gradual appearance on the public scene and exercising and utilizing various public activities. It has greatly succeeded in implementing this stage. It also succeeded in achieving a great deal of its important goals, such as infiltrating the government gaining religious institutions and embracing senior scholars, universities, gaining public support and sympathy and establishing a shadow government, a secret government within the government. Phase three, escalation phase prior to conflict and confrontation with the rulers through utilizing mass media currently in progress. Phase four, open public confrontation with the government through exercising the political pressure approach. It is aggressively implementing the above mentioned approach and training on the use of weapons domestically and overseas in anticipation of zero hour. And in phase five, seizing power to establish the Islamic nations under which all parties and Islamic groups are united. This, and they, they claim to be at phase four already. Is yeah? that the document that uh, Brigitte Gabriel was uh, publishing yes. that they found in the States? Yeah, yeah, the FBI discovered this in a secret cache in the guy's house in a secret basement. And this was this went to court. This was presented at court. It was never been contested. It's never been declared to be false. So they Please send it also be, when you prepare yeah. everything. Thank you. Okay. So they have hundreds of these secret organizations. Okay. So um, I'm not going to go into that. And just one more thing I want to do from this document, then I'll do something else. Okay. So. <clears throat> okay. 
So let's apply information dominance. So Muslims are very good at information dominance. So let's apply information dominance doctrine to medicine. Let's say, for example, the words heart, the word attack, the word cardiac, the word arrest, and the word cholesterol become illegal because you're a heart attackophobe if you say these words, okay? Imagine these words were scrubbed from medical texts and made taboo because they're hateful, bigoted, and worst of all, heartophobic towards peaceful, gentle hearts, okay? So you can't use these five words, heart, attack, cardiac, arrest, and cholesterol. So then to describe the problem, you have to say, I'm suffering from body extremism. I'm having violent upper body extremism. I'm having violent extremism of the chest. I'm suffering from chest extremism. I'm having violent chest cavity palpitations. I'm getting chest pain extremism. I'm having chest violent extremism. I'm having upper thorax extremism. I'm all chests are the same. They're extremists in every chest. Diet has nothing to do with thorax extremism. Extremism has no diet. Hospitals that discuss hearts are racist and heartophobic. Heart profiling is racist. You can't check hearts. That's, that's, that's heartophobic. Heart textbooks can only be understood in Arabic. You know, heart textbooks can only be understood in Arabic. That medical diagnosis is out of context. Don't use the words heart attack. Rather say body extremism. Are you anti-cholesterol? You're promoting cholesterol hatred. You hate 1 billion cholesterols? This has nothing to do with hearts. Do you understand how Muslims have taken over language? They have won the information dominance war. Language gets twisted. It fails to describe anything. Understand? And, of course, let's do one more thing. This is the last section here, then I'll do one. Yes? It's very similar to the walk nonsense today in in the academies. Yes, it's military... It's military ideological warfare doctrine. It's all coming from Marxism, and now I, I fully understand that everything is connected. Gnosticism is Marxism, is yes. woke, is Islam, is everything mm-hmm. that we are dealing with. Yes. Yes. So w- would you so, agree that the Muslims are just the first civilization that were conquered, basically, by those ideas? And they just have a different kind of poison for the West because of the characteristics of the West. Yeah. I, that that would make a fair statement. They're irrational. They have been, they've been captured by this ideology. They've got their own flavor of it, their own twist on it, their own spin on it. But yes. Thank you. So final thing here before I move to the last section. Okay. So elevator pitch. The aim of your enemy is to inhibit critical analysis, right? So the, the Muslims want to inhibit critical analysis of Islam so that you cannot understand the enemy. The enemy doesn't want you to understand the enemy. Do not let the enemy know he's your enemy. Make him unable to realize there's an enemy and to define that enemy. So what they do is they create arguments that inspire one, shame. You do not critically examine or defend what you are ashamed of. You're a white supremacist racist. Your family owned slaves and, and you, you, you tortured my family for hundreds of years and my country was built on... On, on our backs, on the backs of slaves. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, take some money. Can I give you a check for BLM? Shame. Two, amnesia. You cannot be inspired by or draw from what you forgot or do not know. So if you don't defend your culture, they will push theirs. If you don't assert your culture, they will push theirs. There are a lot of Jew-hating Jews out there, quite bluntly, right? There are a lot of Jew-hating Jews with bullshit understanding of history and fucked up logic and morals, Okay that have no understanding of the appreciation of their culture, all right? And they support depraved, sick, violent, pedophilic, disgusting cultures because, look, same goes for Catholics, same goes for a lot of people. But the woke, they've successfully done that, okay? Defend your culture, believe in it. So amnesia, if you don't remember who you are, if if you're not rooted to a particular set of morals, cultural precepts, you cannot identify enemies, you cannot identify friends, you don't know who you are, where you are, where you're going, where you come from. You're just a leaf in the wind and they will blow you away. And irrationality. Destroy logic and evidence with rhetoric, propaganda, and emotion. Well, emotion, woke, screaming, shouting, no debate, no logic, right? Irrationality. Destroy reason. Destroy logic. And these people are not reasonable. So understand, you need to, you need to fight back. You need to, you need to defend your culture and you need to shame them. You need to not have amnesia. You need to, in fact, rub their culture and their history in their face, their doctrine in their faces. Use your influence in media, right? 
And final thought. So now I'm going to close all of this and I'm going to go to the final section. Okay, give me one sec. Um, there's one more thing that I need to do. And <clears throat> so I'm going to be very brief here. I'm not going to go through everything, but I want to here go to Seaman. Okay, let's talk about Muhammad a little bit. Okay, I don't want to do everything on Muhammad, but but let's read through um, let's read through the hadiths. Okay. Um, Okay, so that, okay, Aisha, Muhammad's wife, actually says in the book by Ghazali, who is considered the most highly knowledgeable scholar after Muhammad himself, she says to Muhammad, it is you who pretend to be a prophet from Allah. That's legitimate. That is, that is legitimate. And in fact, in the Hadith, it states the superiority of Aisha over other women. So she is the most superior of Islamic women. Okay, but let me go back here. I need to find all the references to semen. So, so let's have a read about who is uh, Aisha, please. Sorry, can you remind us uh, who is uh, Aisha? Muhammad's please? wife, she was six years old. Muhammad married her at six, yeah, but okay. she fell ill, and for two and a half, three years, he couldn't have sex with her. So, he slept with her at nine once she recovered from an illness, which, which I showed in the previous episode, made pedophilia legal in Islam. There is no lower age limit. I can show all of that. But that is in my show. I have, a, I have several talks on that. There is no lower age limit for sex with the, with the little girl in Islam. There is no lower age limit. Nothing. Right. So Muhammad's six-year-old wife scraped semen off his clothes with her fingernails. Narrated Aisha, I used to wash the traces of Janaba, semen, from the clothes of the Prophet. He used to go for prayers while traces of water were still visible. I asked Aisha about the clothes soiled with semen. Narrated Suleiman bin Yasar. She replied, I used to wash the semen of the clothes of Allah's messenger. This is a six-year-old girl, okay? I heard Suleiman bin Yasar talking about the clothes soiled with semen. He said that Aisha had said, I used to wash it off the clothes of Allah, and he would go for the prayers while water spots were still visible on them. I used to wash the semen off the clothes of the Prophet, and I used to notice one or more spots on them. I used to scrape off the semen from the garments of the messenger of Allah. And pertaining to the scraping off of semen from the garment of the messenger of Allah, he then went out for prayer in that very garment where she scraped the semen, where he got, you know, the messenger of Allah and washed semen. I used to wash it from the garment of the messenger of Allah. I used to scrape the semen. On another occasion, she said the semen from the garment of the messenger of Allah. Aisha, semen used to get on the garment of the messenger of Allah and he would wash it off, then would go pray. I often scraped semen from the garment of the messenger of Allah with my hand. Now, here's a question for those who are of you who are devout Jews. Do you, do the, do the Jewish writings talk about how Rebecca was washing, scraping semen with the fingernails with the garments of Moses, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham? Is that like part of these, of, of the, of the Jewish texts anywhere? Not that, not that I know. Not, yeah, well, no, but absolutely this, not. Yeah. When I found semen on the garment of the messenger of Allah, I scraped it off my nails. Like, thanks for sharing this bullshit. Understand. Now, I can go into length about the character of Muhammad, about his murders, his assassinations. But do you understand? He even, man, there's so much to be said. I would, I would just need hours. But do you understand? This is, there's, it's disgusting. This is disgusting. So, yeah, I guess that's that's it from me. Okay. Um, I hope you will be willing to come again. Uh, you're doing us a big favor. And I would like to remind all my friends that uh, Lloyd is taking a risk bringing all this information out there. So at least, please say thank you to him uh, with all your hearts if you appreciate what he just did for us. And uh, please come again. And if you can tell us how we can donate to your work or help in any way. Oh, wow. Yeah, I didn't do that, did I? <laughs> um, uh, okay, well, yeah, give me one second, please. Let's say thank you for the meantime. It's very appreciated. Appreciate. 
Uh, thank you. Um, Bob, any... Great, I need to meanwhile, find something. Me but... Okay, yes? meanwhile, I want to say to you that I uh, grow with the Arab neighbors in my childhood and my also my family before hundred years ago here, and I speak mm -hmm. Arabic, and they're yeah. amazing, and that I'm feeling now like a foolish, that I think that I know something about the Islam. Uh, I want to thank you very much for all this knowledge and open, open our eyes to this subject. It's very, it was very amazing. You know, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll, I need to find the, the correct links. Give me one second. So I have a YouTube channel. I'm just going to link you to my YouTube channel in a moment. Um, so yeah, I never. Okay. So I'm going to drop this in the chat. Um, yeah, I never think of these things. That's a problem. Uh, this is my YouTube channel, which is being dropped in the chat. I'm just going to repeat it three times. Those are my videos. You guys can, can learn from my videos. I have hundreds of videos. I have detailed ones, short ones, long ones, and um, hopefully they will teach you a great deal about Islam, right? Um, and I provide all the sources. I'm going to provide the sources as well. And if you guys would like to support, and I appreciate that. I mean, that would be, I'd be very grateful. Uh, these are some links that you can use, um, right? So, yeah, I don't like using PayPal, but, but there it is. Um, so if you guys would like to support, the, those are, those are ways that you guys, you guys could possibly do that. Um, yeah. So, yeah, but any, any last questions? Is there anything that you guys would like to ask? Yes, I have a question. Sure. It's a, it's a technical one. Like, I, I understand that you're, um, um, endangering yourself talking about it. So how it's possible that you have uh, like channels and you, and you, you speak about it and you have videos about it and like, because you know, I have a big mouth and I don't give a shit and I'd kill them if they came after me and they know that someone has to talk about this. Someone has to stand up to this bullshit. Someone has to expose the lie. Someone doesn't right. Then, then we are culpable. We are, we are, we are guilty of being cowards. This is the, these are the facts. This is the truth in four years. I have not had a single Muslim, not one, willing to meet with me publicly on a live stream. And I've said, please, guys, look, these are the Islamic sources, right? These are all of these are authorized. These are all attested. There's so many, there's so much evidence to prove that these books are the ones that are the best, absolutely highest priority Islamic law manuals. Let's read them together. Let's simply open them. You say Islam is perfect. Muhammad is perfect. You say this is the perfect law of Allah. Muhammad brought the perfect law. It is beautiful. It is good. It is amazing. Let's show the world it. Let's just read it and explain it to me. Let's do this in public. In four years, not a single Muslim has been willing to do that because it's illegal for them. All right? So they, and look, I mean, first of all, I, I'm, just, I'm taking a risk. And I, you know, people have been stabbed. Salman Rushdie got stabbed in the eye recently, didn't he? Got, got stabbed a few times. People have been killed for talking about this. I live in Poland. I think I'm fairly safe. And um, I was in the Middle East. Someone has to do this. Someone has to do this. Um, and no, of, um, course, of course, I understand that the yeah. truth needs to be said. But but um, like technical wise, you know, people speak today about things happening in the world and they're closing their uh, accounts. So, mm -hmm. so, and I, I know that it's they have I power. It's a, look, it's a risk I take. But the thing is, I keep it very factual. I say nothing without showing the references, showing the sources. Do you understand? I back up everything meticulously with sources. Everything, so, every, so all the proof, links that you saw. Yeah. So Sorry? proof and facts are the shield of the truth. So far, so good. Yes. Look, my channel is not that big that I get huge attention, but I am known, right? I am known. But I only made myself public once I lived in Poland, where it's pretty safe. See? Yeah, but... It, I'm, I'm asking the question and speaking about it because it's very, 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 very uh, uh, important for uh -huh. who, whom that listens to the recording or is here to understand that mm -hmm. we don't need to be afraid of speaking the truth because the truth... No, no, not at all. Because here's the thing. 
when when more people speak about it, you know, it's like they it's like it's like being attacked by mosquitoes by not just one. One mosquito you can kill, two you can kill, a thousand men, you just run away, right? Understand. If everybody starts posting this stuff on social media, then they cannot stop it. Understand. It will destroy their narrative. It will ruin them in their narrative. There is nothing in the Sharia that is good. All the Sharia men will say the same thing. They always say, Lloyd, that's the wrong Sharia man you will. You need to get the right one. I'll say, okay, which is the right one? They'll never tell me which the right one is. Okay. Somehow they can never show it to me. And then if you look at any of the Sharia manuals, they all say the same shit. It's the same bullshit, the same depraved crap in every single one. There is no deviation. So what's that? So if everyone does it, they can touch no one because everyone's doing it. It's they, they cannot stem the flood. It's that simple. They will be destroyed on the basis of just these facts pouring out. Use your if, social if media it, influence. Yeah. If it's so bad, why why like people go for it? Serious. People don't know about it. This is a secret. It's illegal for Muslims to talk about it. It is treason. It is literally treason for them to talk about this. And academia is bought and paid for. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, pour billions of dollars into universities, billions, to own the academic voice. They own the academics. They own the departments. They own the printing presses. This is, this is that's that simple. It's up to us. Uh, it's up so to it's ignorance. Ignorance and also willful blindness. You'll find that scholars, look, I will mop the floor with some scholars who profess to be experts in Islam. I mean, sh and, but these scholars will say, well, you know, one plus one. Oh, there's a bunny. Oh boy, it's lunchtime. Let's, let's go get some food. They will never form the conclusion. They'll put one over there and they'll put one over here. And then you'll never hear the two because they know they'll either get stabbed or they will lose their funding. It's that simple. It's up to you and me. It's that simple. How, how well versed are the, uh, the, yeah. is the average Muslim? It's hard to tell. He can't tell you. That's the problem. They know it implicitly. They know some of these things generally. They have to know some of it. But the knowledge is really with the imam who will direct them. Their job is to follow implicitly. Their job is to follow without question. But many Muslims do know enough. Let's say enough of them know this stuff. Hamas indoctrinates their people. They will, they will read this stuff. They will study this. They'll have classes on it. They'll have tests on it. They'll have memory competitions on it. Hamas, ISIS, all the theocracies, the, the Iran revolutionary guards, they know this shit backwards. Better than you and me. I you talk on one of the, uh, your shows in, the, in the YouTube, then you explain that like, there, there is like a pyramid uh, structure. Yes, there is. Yeah. Can you explain um, I did show it briefly before. So you've got, okay, there are four layers, there are four levels in Islam, okay? It's a secret, but again, there are four levels and there are two divisions. You have the administrative or the sharia, the legal, and on the other side, the spiritual, the Gnostic, which is for the Sufis only, right? For the highest scholars who are in the top two levels. So you've got the Ibarra level, which is the lowest level of ignorance. Okay, it's the level of ignorance. It's the literal level. It is the plain level. It is the what the scholars call Islam for the masses, the Ibarra level. Then you've got the ishara, the level of allusion, the level of hidden meaning, right? This is for your trained imams, right? They, they understand the deeper meaning that is not explicitly written in the Quran. Your third level is called the lata'if, which is from Latifa, which links, as far as I can tell, to Sophia, the wisdom, right? The lata'if. And also, is also known, so Sophia is the goddess, the goddess of wisdom, but it's, she's the final eon, from the Gnostic pantheon that created the Demiurge, the evil god that made the world. Okay, Yahweh is Satan. So she made Satan, and Satan made the world. Satan is the, the god that the Jews... Yahweh yeah, the Baot. Is, yeah, exactly. So he's the Demiurge, he yelled about, he's Satan, that's the god of the Jews. Okay, so Satan is the god of the Jews, that's the Gnostic Demiurge. And then, and then so, so she created that. So Lataif is like Sophia, it's like the Arabic version of the Greek Sophia the Gnostic goddess. So they have a certain knowledge which is reserved for the saints, okay? A certain deep spiritual illumination, right? Then there's a fourth level for the greatest of the Sufis only called the Haqqaiq, the, the final reality. However, Lataif is also linked to, to um, Lilith, the Laylat. Lataif is linked to Laylat. Laylat is Lilith, and you guys know who Lilith is. She's the demon Within the Jewish scriptures, she Jewish text, she is the demon that was supposedly the original wife of Adam, but she turned on God. She turned against God, like like Satan turned against God, Lucifer, or whatever. She turned against God. She was a demon that ate babies. 
So, so yeah, so that, that, that's the third level. And then the fourth level is the ultimate reality. Muhammad was, Muhammad is part of Allah. He was taken from Allah's essence and Allah made Muhammad. And then Muhammad, tiny fractions were taken from Muhammad and, and placed into Abraham, David, Moses, Jesus, and everyone else that's a prophet in the Bible. So that's the story. And these, and these guys get to the fourth level. So, so that's the four levels. Wow. Total gnostic, yeah. gnosticism. Yeah. No, but but it's it's it shows it shows the like I can connect everything that we we learn here, um, all of the like it's the monopoly of the the earth like everything is um, by it like you have four stages like all the masses it's the same we don't call ourselves uh, Muslims or whatever but we we do things that they want us to do because they control um, um, parts of our consciousness because they control the masses, they control the, the, the universities, the, the governments, the, the, the other religions, the, the food industry, uh, water, like name it, it's there um, yeah. because people so... are there. And if people believe something and they're doing something, it's there. So Islam, these people are deadly serious. You see, the only fight you have, if you don't have $10 billion and a government at your back and the secret information apparatus that runs the world, the only thing you can do is speak the truth. Now, understand that the ideology is fragile. There are certain limitations. There are certain innate fragilities within the ideology, within that's recognized within ideological warfare. There are certain fragilities and so just speaking the truth, you massively damage, just revealing it publicly, you massively damage their public image. You massively damage the, the spread of their message. The truth is that's why they have to, that's why they have to um, censor, right? That's what they have to control because if the message gets out, it will severely damage them. It undermines their message. It prevents it further indoctrination. It prevents them from further stealing minds, right? Capturing minds. So you need to get this out, but you need to be factual. We're not, I'm, I have zero interest in conspiracy theories. I have no time for that shit. You, you know what you, we're doing in, here in the group, by the way? No idea. We're, we're, um, we're teaching people to um, think independently. We, to reason. We, yes. Okay. And yeah, to think. You can think only about reason. You can uh, believe uh, imaginary things, but uh, and stories, but at I'm the end, I'm doing a talk can... tomorrow night on on Aristotelian logic. Wow. I'm actually doing a detailed talk. I've got it. It's going to be like ten weeks, like one talk a week on Aristotelian logic and well, also scholasticism. The talk, yeah. I will share it here with, live with, while with you Shane? do it on the one second, Don. While you do it on the YouTube, I think I will share it live and the broadcast here in the group for my members. So you can they join it if you if you want. Which time exactly? Uh, seven p.m. my time, which will be eight yours. And I know it's not too much, but seven p.m. is convenient for me typically. So seven p.m. my time tomorrow. That's a beautiful idea. Uh, we are speaking here about objective morality, objective reality. Yeah. You know, basic things because people are in la la land with we're, their uh, relative nonsense. If I may, if I may, Eric, yeah. um, take responsibility at the end, Lloyd. They need to take responsibility about their. Um, it, you showed three steps there. It was shame, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, uh, amnesia, irrationality. Amnesia and irrationality. Yeah, and it's the same. If you are rational, if you are brave, and if you like, if you do the opposite, you can you can be yourself, and truth will be there at the end. Um, yeah. yeah. I think yeah, it's so I'll be doing point. that tomorrow. I'll be talking on that if you guys are keen. Um, join the join the live chat. Um, you know, subscribe subscribe to my channel. I'd appreciate that. Give me support on the channel by, you know, subscribing and sharing my videos. And uh, there's going to be a Q and A and stuff and something. After. I I have a conversation, so I do a lecture, but it's I have a conversation, so I engage with the chat. It's not just me talking. I have conversations. But so I, I, I always prepare slides. I've got 100 slides currently. So I prepare slides and I work through in very great detail. I provide all my sources. Everyone sees my sources. I never hide my sources. I make everything available. So everyone can see exactly where I'm getting my content from. It, I, I don't, it's possible to, it's very it's possible to join? 
yes, of course, on my on my YouTube channel. Just jump in the chat. Ah, like the 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 interaction is through the YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Okay. Perfect. Lloyd, thank you very thank much. You. I really hope you have a again. Telegram um, group? Maybe. Oh, channel. Say so again, Do you have a Telegram group? Like in this platform? No, I couldn't be bothered. I'm not even on Facebook anymore. I just can't be bothered. Sorry, I just. It could be a good idea. We. This is a great platform. Uh, so far, uh, as we use. I have a life, you know. I. <laughs> Honestly, I have other things to do as well. This this shit gets up my. You know, I mean, this is depressing. This is depressing stuff, you know. <laughs> no, don't, don't be depressed. I do no, have the time for this one. To tell me, Eleanor was was talking nonsense in the chat today. Um, and um, did, did this? Did did I give you a clear understanding that that she has no idea what she's talking about? Yeah, we already said that to her earlier, but you gave us more. Uh, evidence and knowledge. Um, obviously, I'm going to force down her throat listening to this lecture, or else if she talks again, she will get uh, the kind mute on this subject. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Pablo, you wanted to say something? Pablo, Pablo, you want to say something? Yeah, just uh, first of all, I wanted to, to thank Lloyd and to just to verify if, if we have time for just one more question. Yeah, sure, I can. It's 10 you after 10 p.m. from here, but yeah, sure, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Okay, that's, I hope it's a short one. Uh, you mentioned that most of this stuff is a kind of secret, and I want to know the relationship with the fatwas. Which are fatwas also... are non-binding, so fatwas are largely non-binding. They are A sheikh has to make a fatwa, so you have to have a certain rank as an imam. Uh, the fatwas are generally public. Um, so yeah, the, I, man, in my talks, I go through various fatwas. I show them on, on, on my talks and I link to them so people can go read them for themselves. And some of them are explicit. It's crazy that they make them public so you can go read them and um, it shock you silly. They turn your hair orange reading some of them, but a fatwa is non-binding. So it's a non-binding, whereas the, the only binding regulations are in the Sharia, right? Those are binding. Those are the decision of all the scholars that this is the final meaning of Allah, but a fatwa isn't is an exposition of what is so basically the, the sharia might be non you might have a non-specific law you might have a general law so the fatwa applies to a specific situation it might be specific to a particular individual or a specific thing so it's not fatwas are generally not general <clears throat> but they can right. be but of it's course they usually are the answered to a commission. yeah it's a, it's a refinement of the rule and usually in response to a question so the question could be from a government could be from a an entity like an organization or a person so a fatwa depends on the context, who it's for, what it's for, but it's a non-binding regulation, but specific to a particular person. Or so it's like the, the it's like the Gemara in. in uh, it's very enlightening uh, reading the list of fatwas on uh, even on Wikipedia. Yeah, Islam QA is fantastic for fatwas. Islam QA, like read the one on is it legal to eat mermaids? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> you eat mermaids? Did you just yeah, say illegal to eat mermaids? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Shit, I don't know. It's a very important question. Someone wanted to know. <laughs> yeah. That was a wonderful <laughs> finale. <laughs> Thank you, Lux. I mean, shit. So next is going to be what spices do you use to cook the thing? I don't know, but so yeah, that's the the fatwas are hysterical sometimes, but there's some pretty sick ones and um, pretty nasty. Yeah. Any other questions before I go? Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh wait, I need to send you document links. Let me do that while I'm here so that I do not forget. Um, Thanks for that. Yeah, sorry. I need to do that so that I don't forget, um, because. Hold on. So I need to, let me give you, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm going to drop these in the chat, but I will send them on later to the admin so that he can post them as a, as a, as a single comment. Okay. I'm just going to do that now quickly so that you guys have access to my texts. Uh, where the heck is the other one here? Just move this over. Give me a second. 
Okay, The Reliance of the Traveler is the very first one. You need that book. Okay, The Reliance of the Traveler is critical. Everyone should read that one. That's the major source that I refer to a lot of the time. Um, the Hedaya, <clears throat> you can download here. You can get my, my copy is indexed, but the thing is, look, um, my copy is indexed and I mean, it's, it's got all the highlights on it, but, um, I didn't post that one, but I'm just posting now. This digest of Muhammad and law, this has that section on, on diddling nine year old girls and younger. Um, so yeah, let me just send you my full research archive. Okay, I have a full research archive. I'm posting this link now, my Google archive. You click on it, it'll take you to a series of folders, and you go to the Islam folder, go to the Sharia folder, you'll find all the references there, everything. So along with many of them, I've highlighted so that I've highlighted the specific sections that are of interest. There's hundreds, there's thousands there. I have software that indexes everything. So I process all the PDFs, and then I have software that, that, that goes through them and indexes them so that I can search so I can search through like 2,000 documents or 3,000 documents. I can search through them and um, so that I can find links and references. So, for instance, if I'm looking for a concept or a word or a term or something in one document, I find this, then I can use it. And within like a second, I've indexed two, 3,000 documents and I can find correlations and, and cross connections. So I can say, okay, this is consistent because it's in 50 documents, you know. So I know I'm dealing with something solid. I, I pay for software that does this. So, um, which <laughs> finicky as well. To, as you saw, it's a little primitive, but uh, yeah, the interface is Windows 95, but the stuff is soft is really good. Um, yeah, any anything else? <laughs> uh, when when are you coming again? <laughs> I'm pushy. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, look, I need a break from this stuff because this stuff really just depresses me. But um, look, I mean, it depends. Is there, is there something else to talk about? Is there anything else to be discussed? Because, look, I jump can... around a lot. I don't always like jumping around a lot. I like to do one topic and finish it rather than jump and jump and jump, you know. But, but today but... you did it. Uh, I did not disturb your order of things today. Yeah, I know, but I still wasn't, like, doing one topic. I was kind of doing different things to cover as many areas as possible. But uh... Maybe you can come one time, one more time, and give us, like, a one, one show about Gnosticism, sure. if you're willing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can do because you have to understand how the, the Gnostic mind works. But yeah. So guys, tomorrow I'm on YouTube. Yeah, that, that would be excellent. Yeah. So I'll be on YouTube. If you guys want to just join the channel, um, you know, join the talk on YouTube. It's a live discussion. I've got slides. I have PowerPoints and, um, which I make available. And then I've got all my resources, which I make available. So you've got all the links. Um, so guys, yeah. So I think that's it. Any, any final, final, final things? Just a big thank you. I hope, guys, open your microphone. Say thank you, please. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Enjoy the YouTube. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, guys, good night. Take care. Take care. Uh, and stay safe out there, right? And um, Hamas, I mean, Islam needs to be destroyed. I mean, seriously. So, all the best to everyone out there. And, um, you know, really all the best for everything that's going on. Okay? Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.